All right. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I am here on Twitch on a Monday. Uh, we decided to do this earlier in the week to keep with everybody's schedule, which is perfect for me. So um, anybody that's not catching this today and might be hearing this over the coming days, I'm going to be doing an edited version of it that I'm going to repost on um, YouTube on Saturday. And I'll be hanging out with you guys in the chat at this time on Saturday. So um, if anybody is kind of getting started on this early throughout the week um, and wants to just wait and watch it with me on Saturday, that would be awesome. But for those of you that are here with us today, I really appreciate you coming by on this Monday afternoon. So today I'm going to be speaking with Craig Williams, who is a specialist in the Vedic sciences of yoga, Ayurveda, Tantra, Vedanta, and Jyotish. He's awarded the prestigious titles of Vita Covid, Yogacharya, and Dharmacharya uh, by Vamadeva Shastri and the American Institute of Vedic Studies. Um, and he is he operates a private practice out of Austin, Texas, specializing in Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and nutrition. And he is the author of Entering the Desert, Cult of Golgotha, and Tantric Physics 1 and 2, which have all been published by Anathema Publishing. He also runs the website ayurvedaaustin.com, uh, where you can learn more about his, him and his practices. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pull Craig now to the chat here. How are you doing today, Craig? Hey, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, the pleasure is mine. I've um, been wanting to speak to you. Basically, I started this channel right around the same time that I started reading your first book, and I have been wanting to speak with you since the very beginning, but uh, we sort of talked back then and decided it was best if I went ahead and read those books before I talked to you, <laughs> which really was the right thing to do. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes my enthusiasm gets ahead of my uh, better judgment. So luckily you were like, maybe you should read the books first. And I'm like, yeah, I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I got, I got about halfway through, um, entering the desert and I was just like, oh man, this is so good. I have, I was positive halfway through entering the desert that I was going to love all three of your books. And I was absolutely not wrong about that. Um, it's oh, been so a, it's been a slow, uh, a slow process, but incredibly educational and enjoyable to get through these three books. So okay. I'm very happy to be on the other side of them now and um to well i i could have kept reading them forever i, I don't want to say it like <laughs> that but and I, I did read them slowly because i didn't want to rush through it even though i was uh interest very excited to have this conversation so uh thank you for being here with me today <laughs> absolutely it's an honor thanks for having me on and thanks for taking the time to to read my work i appreciate that um, I, I was going to go through your other titles here, but I was afraid I was going to butcher them. So I <laughs> stopped oh, halfway. No, uh, it's a, uh, it's very interesting to see that you, uh, I mean, when you, when, when I, when I read books, uh, especially more esoteric books, um, it just seems like sort of anybody can call themselves anything. And it is really, uh, interesting to see like how many titles you do have that have been given to you, not by yourself, but by other people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Joe's my age. I've been around for a while. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, even still, you know, some people, I, I, it appears that you've got you got into this at a pretty young age. Um, that's sort of how I wanted to get this started a little bit was for you to sure. just give us maybe um, a sort of a background of yourself, uh, where you are from, uh, if you if this is where you've been most of your life, and what sort of I mean I know you you are sort of into a lot of different things uh, that that you bring all together, especially through uh, Cult of Golgotha. But mm -hmm. maybe, you know, some sort of a condensed version of what got you to where you are today. Sure, absolutely. No, I'm from, from Louisiana. That's my home. I live in Texas now. But Louisiana will always be my home. But I, I grew up, um, as, even as a young child, really fascinated with philosophy <clears throat> and religion from East Asia and specifically India. 
And so I was immersed in that as a child, but I also was really interested in to, uh, Rudolf Steiner, Aleister Crowley, other, you know, more kind of European esoteric streams of thought. Um, and so those were all interweaving all through my life. And then eventually I went into medicine, specializing in Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. Um, and that's kind of what I do for the bulk of my life now. But uh, I would definitely, you know, if someone asked me what my philosophy or what my religion is, I'm, I'm definitely him. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, that would def- that's, that's definitely my home. That's my root. Um, all my work revolves around my my belief in Sanatana Dharma, and my faith as a Hindu, and my connection to those lineages. Um, but I also have a deep love for many different streams of esoteric thought, um, which can, you kind of mentioned, which I kind of, that was the whole point of why I wanted to write Cult of Bogata, was to kind of show this other background that I experienced growing up. Which I think those are very important as well too. But that's it. And that's a quick uh, kind of a reader's digest version. Yeah, perfect. Got, got where I was today. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and so like with me, uh, as as I said through social media a couple of times, and I think here on Twitch as well, um, it seemed like probably going with your books in the order that you wrote them would have been the best way for me to do it. I started with entering the desert, then went to cult of Golgotha, sure. then went to both, both parts of tantric physics. But yeah, I think, yeah. um, in order to fully understand you, it would have made the most sense for me to read the, um, uh, tantric physics part one before I, because my initial thoughts were that you were a lot more focused on the Western, um, traditions and and especially once i got into tantric physics and then uh watched your other interviews relating to tantric physics then it became clear to me that that's really your uh your home is in is in uh es- hinduism esoteric hinduism tantra yeah. uh these sorts of uh these different sort of branches or specializations within hinduism which is such an overarching term um and it is i mean that just that whole field of what we call hinduism is it's just vast. Um, yeah, and so many different streams flowing through it. So for me, I sort of feel a little bit like there's some connections, but I am not. I'm absolutely not as nowhere near as educated on these things as you. But sort of like I, I grew up um, Roman Catholic, and yeah, I got okay. into Wicca when I was like 13 years old, um, mm-hmm. and then I, I then I was pretty outright uh, atheist or at least agnostic for the next 15 years after that. But I always had this feeling that um, Hinduism really resonated with me and made a Hinduism and Buddhism really resonated with me, but I never really had a place that it just felt like it was such a big subject that had so many, so many different possible points of entry and so many different branches that I just never knew where to even start studying it at. So to, so that's a good point. yeah, Yeah. So to sort of like stumble into the topic through entering the desert. And then, uh, as I moved through your books, it became more and more centralized on the, the esoteric Hinduism, um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that really sort of gave me an inroad to say, OK, this is where you start. You know what I mean? And right. I had seen some comments as I've been looking through different YouTube videos. As I said, I've watched a lot of your interviews and mm-hmm. um, watched like different reviews of your book. And I think, you know, some people that I don't think had read the book tantric physics right. i'm speaking about right. said that this isn't really a good introduction there th- you're going you you jump in too deep and i if, after right, right. Ha- at me not having any history in hinduism and having just finished reading that book i have to disagree and i think that it's an absolutely amazing entry point but people didn't like that you used um a lot of sanskrit and again i disagree with that i think right, um right, right. It, it's absolutely necessary if you're going to be speaking about these topics to have the sanskrit involved there so yeah. I, I and for me i wrote up my own dictionary sort of glossary to go along with it as i read i just had a notebook beside me and every sanskrit word or concept that i didn't understand i wrote it down and wrote down either your definition or i went to like something like yogapedia and found their definition 
and then wrote that all down and then came back to your book again. And then I knew what I was taught, you know, then I knew where I was yeah, reading. Yeah. So yeah. you could have wrote a 700 page book, just filling it with definitions, which to me is yeah. unnecessary. You're, you're not here to tell us the definitions of Hinduism. You're here to explain your path and yeah. what you, you know, what you wanted to get across didn't need all of that elementary um, sort of stuff that we can find anywhere. We don't need you to explain basic definitions to us. We need you to explain, you know, where to go with this thing. And that's what really I, I found amazing about it. And as I said, it's a slow read because I it felt like a course to me where I really was like, OK, I need to uh, I need to digest this before I move on. I need to understand all of these definitions. And then I went back to the top of the page and reread it. You know what I mean? Um, right, right, right. Which I learned a lot in your entering the desert, you know, where it that really was like a, a way of teaching me how to read your next two books. Um, right. so, uh, well, okay. So before we get into entering the desert, I wanted to ask a little bit more about your history. Um, so have you actually been to like India or Nepal or Haiti? These are the three places I was interested to see if you've been to them and had any direct it, experience. Yeah. India and Nepal quite a bit. Haiti. No, unfortunately, um, uh, I was planning a trip to go to Haiti, um, a year before COVID, then they had some. Hey, unfortunately, Haiti can be difficult for traveling depending on the status of their government. Yeah, and there's been a lot of unrest there um, the past couple of years and years before that. But no, I've been to extensively to Nepal, to Tibet, to India. Um, those were those were very important places. So I, I have a deep love uh, for Haiti, um, both due to my studies in Martinism and the Martinism roots there, and just the beautiful art there and beautiful culture um, so that, that's something that is kind of a personal passion of mine and when i was young uh i would get, i was in my early 20s uh, when i was living in louisiana i was part of a spiritualist church and two of the members uh, of the spiritualist church were haitian immigrants and they were very interesting mentor figures for me um, and then i became <clears throat> close friends with dr reginald crosley who wrote um, the Voodoo Quantum Leap, and, and he's a very, very beautiful Haitian poet, and, and a theol. Uh, he's so much hard to describe Reginald Crosley, but he uh, really kind of inspired me also to just to kind of look at the roots of Haiti, and so you can see some of that coming up through uh, multiple gothic. But I, I, pre I appreciate your feedback on the the Sanskrit concept too. That that's something that uh, I don't. I never wanted my book to be some kind of academic book. You know, people have access to information now. They can Google and find any definition of any term. And I just wanted them to do, I wanted it to be more a vision of my experience in my life. And then they can kind of, you know, figure out from there. Yeah, exactly. And like, um, I was listening to you talking about the Bhagavad Gita a few days ago. And uh, you were saying with that book where... Um, it's not a good idea for people that aren't familiar with the book to go into one of the versions that have all of the explanations. Like the first time yeah. you read it, you should just read it. And then yeah. after you've read yes, it, yes, then yes. you can like dig deeper and deeper and deeper into things. But um, I, I think, you know, your book, it, it's the same thing to me where it's like, if you had cut everything up and, and stuck definitions in there, it would have just, we would have lost the narrative. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, you need yeah. to follow what you're talking about. Not, it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not that. <laughs> so no, I'm I glad agree. you I'm didn't make it that because it would have been really convoluted if you had. And I think, you know, people that had that opinion really hadn't thought into what would have happened if you had taken that direction. So I'm glad you yeah. didn't. I think I think you did it the exact way that it should have been done. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going. I appreciate that insight. And that was that was one of the reasons why I wrote Entering the Desert was because I wanted to go ahead and write some text that had no Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. that, that had some kind of primordial uh, kind of root or kind of a blueprint for people uh, to kind of create or formulate some type of spiritual path. Uh, but what, not limited by Sanskrit, because I don't particularly think everyone needs to study Hinduism unless they feel called to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's very simple. 
and so you know so in in one way that's that it that makes it good that i started with entering the desert because that one is sort of a guideline for how to live a spiritual existence without yeah, yeah. the necessity of any you you can i anybody can read entering the desert and they can put their own sort of religious leanings or spiritual leanings on top like it's it's a guideline it really seems exactly. like this is how you build your home this is how you build your life this is how you sit down and think and then do whatever you want after that but this is how you yeah. get started so that was a really cool i mean i've already been um working with quaria for a few years but it, right, there right. was never really a way that um, where they said where, you know, Josephine would say, like, this is how you should sit down and read my book. And yeah, um, yeah. so my first impressions of entering the desert, I was putting Quaria on top of entering the desert. See, but, that's beautiful. Um, but I, for what, you know, I for, wanted it, I, I want, no, you're that's perfect. And I, that really makes me happy to hear that because I wanted entering the desert to be a text that if someone was. A Catholic, they were a Thelemite, they were Buddhist, they were Hindu, they were just a overall agnostic um, or, or any type of pagan uh, spiritual path. They could just take that and then just call it, fill, you know, paint. That's kind of like a just kind of like a chalk drawing. They could color it in with their own nuances, what they either what they believe or what tradition they come from. So I I really appreciate that feedback. Cool. Yeah. No, no problem, man. So. um so let's I, I'd like to for you to tell us a little bit about the cell um, mm -hmm. and just, you know, give, you know, I mean, obviously this this is now pertaining specifically to entering the desert. Um, yeah. One yeah. of one of the main points that I got out of entering the desert was all of the things that you said about how to build your cell, what the cell is, how to work yeah. within it. So if you want to give us just a little bit of in your own words, what the cell is. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think that that was obviously influenced by my love of uh, reading Desert Fathers, the Desert Mothers, and their writings, those types of things. But it's also a very important concept of how our environment molds us, how our environment creates. But it's also a very symbiotic alchemical relationship because not only is that, we tend to think of that negatively oftentimes or in a pejorative manner. People often will say things like, this certain particular environment makes me feel a certain way. Uh, and that is true. You know, I, I, I was, I grew up going to Catholic school. Um, my family was not Catholic, but they sent me to Catholic schools. And so, and, and also a Southern Catholic in Louisiana, which is very Gothic almost. And that environment definitely molded my love of ritual, the love of sacraments, um, that kind of idea. So, there's positive and negative ways our environment can mold us, but we can also mold our own environment. We can create our environment to make them conducive to what we want to do too. And so I think that was overlooked a lot. And that's why I wanted to put that in the book. Um, the idea that the world itself, um, we talk about the contemporary world, which is, you know, technology driven, fast paced, you know, grossly secular, um, and definitely homogenizing consciousness in the sense of making everyone a number, everyone the same. If we only exist in that world, and it's also dramatic, you know, dramatically cut away from nature in most cases for most people. Um, I wanted the people to see that and that they had to create some kind of sacred space within their home um, that they could go into to kind of like clear out the chronic residue or the astral sludge of the day. And then also to feed the positive energy into it so that once they were in that space, they could quickly enter a certain state of consciousness, which allowed them to perceive the deeper states of their studies, deeper states of consciousness, or whatever their particular path was. Um, and then, you know, everyone's living environment can be different depending on where they live. So um, it could be a corner of a room or it could be your own private small study. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything that specific, but having a small altar, having a sacred space, all those things are very important. And I guess so the cell chapter was something I really wanted that to emphasize, at least it, to at least get people thinking about it. Yeah, that's the thing that I really liked about it was it wasn't like there's not a specific 
place that you need to go. There's you're not like prescribing a certain sized room or any of right. these things. It's like uh, as um, as uh, Gabriel said, uh, the founder of Anathema, he was like, you know, for him, um, his cell is in his office when he yeah, is working yeah. on when he's working and he just needs a break and needs to get into that more spiritual headspace for a little while. He basically just turns his chair around to his altar and that is his cell. And yeah, so yeah. it's it's not about going, it's not about building something. There's not a, a certain amount of money that's required to be, uh, to do this thing. It's just, it's a headspace. And exactly. um, you, you can do little things to, to adjust that, that physical space to make it more uh, appropriate. But it's really about how to get your head into a, a place than, than of the physical realm that you're actually in. Exactly. Um, now, uh, and then that's the, and that's the, a theme you can see running throughout all my work. I mean, that's even the title for tantric physics too: sacred space, sacred yeah, body, sacred space. So you know, and once we're we're building an exterior ritualistic space, um, it's also that there's an internal resonance that's happening while that's going on too. So then we have this symbiosis between this internal ritual space and this external ritual space. Um, and that, that's a very important kind of con contrast or connection. Yeah, and so um, a, a specific element of the cell that uh, you more or less already answered it in the book, and I think I know what the answer to my question is going to be, but I still want to hear how you answer it anyway. Um, <laughs> and so before I even get to the question, I want to say that um, for entering the desert, uh, you uh, either you worked along with or there was music that was inspired by this book that mm -hmm. ended up coming along with the original hardcover editions. Yes. Um, yes. That was, uh, it was the music of Alone in the Hollow Garden, Namkar, mm -hmm. and Shababa. And really, really great stuff. And then your, um, your later book, Tantric Physics, also not directly connected as much so as the first one was, but uh, Maha Pralaya, which is what we were playing here on the, as, as we did the countdown, um, did an album that they have up on their Bandcamp page that was inspired by Tantric Physics. Mm -hmm. um, so I know, I know uh, after having spoken with Gabriel what his feelings are on this topic, but... Um, and I didn't ask him in the live interview, actually. But so what I what I want to know is, is that music good for just kind of casually reading books, particularly your books? Um, because I, I you make a pretty big point that you should you should be in silence, like total silence when right. you are uh, reading, especially sacred texts or when you're meditating or reciting mantras or any uh, chanting mantras, I should say. Um, is there any room in that silence for dark ambient or should it really be kept to the recreational reading category? No, that's a great question. And, and I think there's a, there's a lot of nuances to that. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a, a great love for ambient music. It's one of my favorite genres. I've loved it since I was a child. I mean, it dates me. I remember being as a, as a kid, my teens, like waiting for Heart to Space to come on the public radio so I could listen to it. It would have, you know, old, uh, very strange music with the early parts of the New Age movement in the 80s when ambient music was starting and Brian Eno and all that. But uh, so I think I love the ability for ambient music to create sound. Um, and so and I love talking with musicians about what was inspiring me as I was writing. Because when I write, uh, I'm I'm a musician myself, I'm a guitar player, and I grew up immersed in music. So I think musically with words, and I think in concepts in my mind. I always see concepts when I'm writing. So it's very easy for me to talk to artists and explain to them what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, and the landscapes. Then I can kind of throw that to them, and they can kind of do, you know it can inspire them in some way, and then they can create something from that. And that to me is very exciting. So I always like to do that as much as I can with artists that I like. And, and so I think um, depending on one's, in Sanskrit, we call that adhikara, the one's kind of readiness, um, you could either use music or not. I mean, because obviously in India, 
music is a very important part of spiritual practice. You know, the, mm-hmm. the ragas, the, day, the morning ragas, the nighttime ragas, all that. So the music definitely has a place in spirituality, um, depending on uh, its vibration and resonance with those, you know, with what you're doing. But ambient music, of course, could be wonderful if you're reading certain things. Um, so I think it depends on what level you're doing that. If you're in more a deeper ritual practice, then you might have some kind of music which helps you get into a certain mind state for the actual ritual. Um, and if you can control that and have nothing bother that, then it can be very powerful. Um, other times, people can just eventually get into a space where you can just kind of click right into that mindset very quickly without having to have uh, so I think it's very diverse. People can use it in any way, but I, I definitely don't think there, there'd be a problem with people reading the book and listening to that kind of music or doing a ritual and using that kind of music as long as they felt that they could still concentrate on what was going on. Okay, you know, it's cool. very much like like it, like running for me. You know, I'm I'm running is a is definitely a huge part of who I am as a human being. Sometimes I love to listen to music when I run. Other times I find it disconnects me from my body. I can't hear my breathing. I can't hear my feet hit the ground. I can't hear things around me. And so I don't like to have, so, you know, so I think that it just depends on my mood of the day, being able to tune in to see where you are. So I think, I think reading or ritual could, could be very Yeah. And to me, um, it, it also, it, I, I really like the way that you answered that. <laughs> oh, right on. <laughs> um, and so, because like, to me, I think if I'm out in the woods, like if I'm taking a hike and I take, a, and I take like a sacred book with me or I, or I yeah. want to do a ritual in the forest, I'm out away from everything. And all I have is the sounds of nature around me. So I don't need music on top of that. Yeah. I have, I have yeah. all of the oral uh, yeah. in stimulation there that is necessary putting music on top of that is dulling down nature and that's yeah. that seems bad uh, yeah. but if you are in the middle of a neighborhood like i i just moved into a more rural area but i was previously sure. living right beside a major highway and just surrounded oh, right. by like a thousand other apartments so it's just yeah. constantly yeah. road noise and people noise and and just everything yeah. is you know whether it's somebody inside the house or somebody outside the house um i the the ambient music drowns out all of that other human noise that's happening and puts and then so it's necessary in those spaces for me to put me into that space but again if i'm out in nature i don't need it so that's that to me seemed like the big difference and i just wanted to see if you sort of agreed with that yeah 100 percent, totally awesome yeah cool and that, that, that that's even a good analogy with running too if i was if i was running on a beautiful trail in nature i definitely would not listen to any music but if yeah. i was having to run through some course i've mapped out the city with a bunch of loud noises then i might then i might want to eat yeah and then especially like because you can take you know there's certain albums that it's like okay i can't get to the creek but i want to hear the creek you know <laughs> yeah totally, totally. Um, yeah so that's why i think i think music and sound are very important for creating um, states of consciousness and also transforming states of consciousness and i think the majority of people live in a world of noise pollution yeah just like we we always talk about like the the junk food we eat but most people are exposed to so much junk noise yeah um and and, and so i think ambient music can really be a way to assuage that and to let them kind of clear that out and um and often, you know, that's why I think a lot of people don't like ambient music because they don't understand it. They don't have the ear for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- th- it's like a, your palate becomes so so numb to other flavors because you're only eating certain kind of things. You have palate fatigue, we'll call it, you know, if you're drinking beer or wine or something like that. So I think that uh, ambient music is really effective for that. It can be very helpful. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I, I I agree entirely, and I'm glad you say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and because you know, there's, it, it, yeah, it to me, it seems like it's absolutely necessary. Uh, for when people are reading, you know, uh, um, I it took me a lot of years to find uh, dark ambient specifically. I sort of knew of ambient music, but I've always been into you know 
heavier metal like darker metal yeah. and it just there were never i i always just went to classical music and classical music sure, is sure. great but dark ambient is better <laughs> to yeah, me to me personally you know what i mean <laughs> yeah um yeah, so yeah. I, I wish i had found that when i was in college because i had to use like piano music to drown out the noise when i was translating latin and i would have right. rather had something darker to listen to while i was translating latin <laughs> right yeah and okay so um before before we move on to cult of golgotha i wanted to have you talk a little bit more about um how you, i i didn't actually write it down and and the term that you use is eluding me right now but mm -hmm. ge general distractions and the ways that humans are just becoming unable to concentrate on things and and yeah. uh, becoming impure, if that's sort of a bad way of describing it, but I'm just trying to sort of lead you in the direction of what I wanted you to speak about a little bit here without having the term in my head right now. But you, you get where I'm going with this, that I'd like you to speak mm -hmm. about uh, the warnings that we need to, to face and what we, why we should use a thing like the cell to avoid those, like what some of these problems are that we, that we deal with on a daily basis as humans in the modern age. Yeah, that's something that that was a big part of entering the desert and why I wrote it was because I started, I felt there was a lot of problematic trends in contemporary culture and contemporary society, which were, which was contributing to the dumbing down of consciousness. And uh, it, we touched on a little bit, one of them is just noise pollution, mm -hmm. like constantly just having cacophony around. And of course, there, you know, that's coupled with poor nutrition and lack of physical activity. And so all that you know, starts to really affect one's ability to concentrate, focus. Um, and then, of course, this, you know, depending on who you, who the reader is, there could be this radical secularism that goes on, which kind of disconnects people from any kind of spiritual path. Um, and that, then they're just disconnected from everything. And then they wonder why they're sad, wonder why they, why they have ADD, wonder why they have ADHD, wonder why they have whatever of the, you know, kind of clinical diagnosis of the day that was created by an insurance company for a, for a code. And so I think those things are very problematic. And so we, you know, and, and no one's going to come save us. That's another thing that's important to keep in mind. There's not going to be some like institution which is going to save us from it. Now spiritual traditions offer them, right? That's that's why traditions have systems, right? So when you study the Vedic text or you study Vaishnava text or you study Buddhist text, they have a whole infrastructure of things to do, things to read, um, and for example, those, those systems would often talk about reading sacred text or reading sacred stories because they wanted the mind to be filled with sacred stories instead of the mind to be filled by sports trivia or TV show or violent movie or, you know, political cacophony, partisan politics, all the stuff that most people just feed in their mind. And then they wonder why they feel the way they do. And so... That's the idea of traditions and these spiritual traditions offered a lot of tools for people to do that. So if they're just cutting the, all that out, there's not really any other tools offered for a lot of people. Yeah, and I that really resonated with me a lot because so many of those things that you just mentioned, I, I, I like as I was reading and, and also hearing you speak about these in, in other interviews, like I'm just like, that's me. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I've got I've, I've over the years, I've got way too caught up in politics as my identity. I've got too caught up in I would have considered myself probably proudly a radical secularist um, for, yeah, yeah, for yeah, many yeah. years. And a lot of these different things you're saying. And I've, I've just keep coming to the conclusion that, like, it leaves me with nothing. You know, um, right. there's there's nothing I you, you can't worship your political party you can't like you can't sit down and do like a political ritual like there's no like when you need some like th th there's just nothing to turn to and i always felt like i've i always said you know e throughout my radical secularist years i always said i envy people that have a religion because you have a place of comfort, a place to turn to, a thing to say, this is what's happening. And 
I could see, you know, the whole time, like, I don't have that. There's no, there's nothing for me to say. This is why I'm here. This is what's going on. This is how to fix my problems. Like, it just mm -hmm. was like, you're, it's all like, well, this is the world. Live in it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And I always tell people, I mean, hey, if, you know, if, if, if the person doesn't have a spiritual path and they feel, they feel amazing they feel inspired, they're passionate about life, and they feel enthusiastic, then awesome. That's great. Yeah. Just keep it up. But it's more about doing some kind of diagnostic evaluation of your state of mind and your state of life and being honest about where you are and what that means. Yeah. And, and the other thing I wanted to throw in there um, is also, as you said about how you grew up Catholic, and as I did too, and one of the main things that I missed of Catholicism was... Uh, just the beauty of of the rituals the beauty yes. of of yes. the the singing and and all of these things that happened in a in the sacred context i didn't yeah. like the specific sermons i didn't like the hierarchy i didn't mm -hmm. like the the history the main thing that i hated about christianity as a whole is the political and social history of the church. Yeah. But when you yeah. put all of those things aside and start to say, okay, well, what if Jesus was not the Catholic church? What if Jesus was yeah. an enlightened figure that had a lot of really wise things to say? And regardless of whether you even consider him the son of God or not, just like, yeah. what if you yeah, thought yeah. about totally. him as a, as a philosopher? And then I was like, okay, now I'm thinking, you know what I mean? That, that sort of was one of those things that got me like, all right, maybe I need to think about this a little harder. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That's beautifully put too. That's one of the reasons why I, uh, I think the Nag Hammadi scriptures are so important. Um, and that's, you know, those are things that I teach constantly and study because there, there's these philosophical and esoteric dreams, which run underneath all these, these social structures that were built up around. We can just pick, I mean, we talked about how diverse Hinduism is, but ancient Christianity was just as diverse yeah. and just as weird and just as weird. Yeah. So, to, to, you know, today we look at it, it seems very, very bland. But, yeah, it's been know, sanitized. Yeah. Heavily, heavily much. sanitized. Heavily, heavily <laughs> but that, the, all those kind of concepts definitely influenced uh, me when I was writing, or the idea behind writing Entering the Desert was to have some kind of primordial ancient kind of view that that is without any kind of hierarchical rule structure in there going on. Yeah. Okay, and so with Cult of Golgotha, um I, so like a couple of these questions i feel like you might be like yeah i'm not answering that and that's okay, oh, no, 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 that's okay. <laughs> well maybe not i don't know so like my first question i want to know here is like is this an actual like sect or religion or is it theoretical or is it something that you and some other people are actually doing well, that's a, actually, that's a great question, and no one's ever asked me that question. Yeah, that's why I'm like, I want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, I wouldn't, it's definitely a sect that with practices going, I would call it a Gnostic system. Um, I wouldn't call it a religion, per mm -hmm. se, but it's definitely a, is a group of, that, that we work with these systems and these ideas. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. Cause I gather, like, some of the, some of the passages in the book come from not your writings but other people within this group's yeah. writings yeah yeah okay yeah there's we, we have a lot of well most of it's kind of like trance writing that was pulled through the use of the rituals during mm -hmm. the work and so uh, i wanted to put a lot of that in there for that um and so that is in there that hopefully i'm glad you saw that a lot of people i don't think caught that yeah, yeah, no, I definitely did, and I was like, okay, you know, because I, 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 I'm thinking about it like, I have so many. That's what I said. I have so many questions. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, These and, are great questions. No, and I'm so, serious. so like on that same line, like, do you consider yourself the founder of the cult of Golgotha? Are you the leader oh. of the cult of Golgotha? Yeah, that's no. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I would say I'm just. Uh, th that was something that, you know, I had intense discussions with Michael Bertrow about this. And, you know, Michael Bertrow's whole idea was for people to look at his work 
and then see what he did and what he created and then go and do that for themselves. Yeah. And, 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 and I feel that the contemporary Bertrand scene has trouble with that. Everyone wants to kind of like copy him mm-hmm. or do cover or do cover album. So to speak, since we're talking about music. Yeah. And, and my, Michael and I had extensive talks and, and, you know, and Michael was saying like, please, you know, take all these things and just create your own, magical worlds with this that's what i wanted to do and that's what he wanted me to do and i and so that was one of the um reasons why cult of good gotham is it's kind of a homage to michael bercher is asking me to do that and that's the same thing that reginald crawsley asked me so please take these ideas and you know develop your own viewpoint with this and so that's something that i wanted to do um with that uh, within that so in that sense it is my creation um you know, it is my own magical system or magical world that I created, but I don't have any desire to necessarily proselytize that. Or, yeah, yeah. But, you know. I was like 90% sure that, you know, that that was the case, but I'm like, yeah. maybe not. Um, I mean, yeah. you, you did lay it out pretty well, like in the book. And also, like I said, I've, I've listened to a lot of your interviews. So sometimes I don't remember if a, if a memory is coming from directly out of the book or out of a previous interview. Right, right. But right, right, right. I, I am assuming that some people haven't seen interviews or read the books, so it really yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, thank you. Totally, um, totally. And so, so that's a very good question. Yeah. Okay. So, do you? Uh, well, I, I'd like you to throw in another point here at the same time as yeah. you're saying this, because um, th- there are other followers, and I would say to an extent they probably are followers of what you are doing. The reason I asked it this way is because you've made it a point to say, like, yes, you should take things in your own direction, but you need to know where you're going. You need to have yeah. a framework, and this isn't a thing that anybody can just build. Whatever You can't just like put down entering the desert and say okay, time to make a cult. You know what I mean? Like you need to like do like work. (laughs) So if you'd like to speak a little on that topic. Yeah. That's another good point because, you know, we can see the dangers of that, right? You can see there's, there's lots of dangers of people who think they can, or just starting some types of cults and different things. And, And I, you know, to me, the idea of using the word cult was something almost hidden small Mm -hmm. cell of a group you know that that's that actually i'm really glad you asked this question because that's something that we haven't talked about it's like so when we say a cult of god it's almost like a hidden cell Mm -hmm. of the study of of these ideas that's that's essentially what it means and i think you're right and it's much like martial arts you know in kung fu we, we spend our lifetime mastering a certain style and then once you reach a certain minimum level of proficiency then you can start kind of moving out and doing your own. You put your own flavor on something that you've already mastered of somebody else's. Exactly. So I, I, same thing with music. Uh, I mean, although people can sometimes not have any instruction and create something very cool with music. So that's, there's always, there's always room for that, Yeah. but that's, that's not as common, right? Those are the outliers. Yeah. And it's almost like, you and the and a person that can do that is almost like whoa like then we're talking yeah, yeah, about like totally. a buddha or a jesus or something yeah, no, like no, that when somebody yeah, can right. say i just brought this out of my head and it's like what and yeah, um yeah. I, his name is eluding me right now but the the guru that uh that you had mentioned um in our private conversation when i said like what image of a guru should i get um oh, ramana, ramana Maharshi. he sort of is also a bit of an example of that right where uh from, it's, from it's, what i've learned of him like when he was a child he didn't know where any of this come from and everybody else was like you know what you're doing right there right and he's like i don't know i'm just doing it yeah actually that's be- that's the most beautiful example you can use you know i mean ramana Maharshi, you know initiated a death state uh, when he was 12 or 13 years old and, and that's just not, people just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that, that by the time he was 13, 14, he'd left his family to go live in a cave and live there for 15, you know, 10 years. And, you know, people started following, even his mother became, became his devotee. So, yeah, that's just not, when, when we see things like that happen, that's very powerful and very original, but most people are not doing that. You know, not, yeah. You know, we might, we might see like, you know, that's the thing now, this, this kind of like a, you know, cult of, of youth where that, you know, we see like a 12 year old kid playing the perfect Yngwie Malmsteen solo uh, or, or, you know, some like, but that's just like a, 
That's like a monkey thing. Like anyone can do that. You can teach them anything to do that. Mm-hmm. If you had a 12 year old that was writing his own new song, fucking Big Mountain, then I'd be like, whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, like but, creating yeah. their own genre that is equally as amazing as him. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the case. So it just gives us structure, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it gives us kind of a, it gives us the tools so that we can kind of learn self discipline, focus, intelligence. I mean, it's, it's, it's no different then all the hoops people have to jump through to become a physician, to become a lawyer. There's a lot of those things people, they're, what they're learning and what they're doing is they're, develop, they're developing critical thinking skills. So that by the time they get to things, they're, they're, it's refined. It's not that, you know, everyone, no one thinks that's a, you know, people blow that off until they're taking their dog to the vet. Yeah. Until they're hiring, until they're hiring a lawyer. And then they're like, that lawyer better be the best. That that better be the best. Yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> then we realize, oh, it's not a bad idea that someone studied all this stuff for a long time and yeah. developed these skills. You know. Absolutely. Um, and okay, so still on the topic of uh, this cult of uh, Golgotha. Gog- um, me and you say it different. I keep saying it the oh, same okay, way. It, I don't think yeah. it matters. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Don't worry about that. Um, so. I think with entering the desert, that was like a one size fits all sort of book that you were writing. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And Cult of Golgotha is very much more, I would say, I I would say it's regionally specific. I would say it's limited to your region. And somebody up in Alaska is going to love that book and find direction for themselves in that book, but they are not going to be able to use it as a direct framework for how to do their own uh, sorts of worship or or anything like uh, what would you say on that how do you how do you feel yeah. about that yeah no that's good because one of the big things that I talk about in Cult of Agatha is kind of a larger extrapolation of what we were talking about re- relating to the cell and the environment so you know in Cult of Agatha all the environments that I lived in and traveled to and connected to molded my consciousness yeah, you know, obviously took Tibet, India, Louisiana, all these things were really connecting with that. Um, and so I think that, and so I, I just came out of that. So, but I would, uh, what I would hope is that someone could read Culture of hopefully find it interesting, inspiring, maybe even troubling. Yeah. And, and then they could see, like, okay, well, what is my environment? You know, exactly. What did I, what, what have I been reading? What have I been studying? What, what were my spiritual experiences as a child that, that, that morphed into something larger? That would be their own math that they would be drawing, their own ideas of that. Yeah, and I'm absolutely not saying that if you don't, that if if you live somewhere other than the southern United States, that you should ignore the book. <laughs> That's not at all what I'm saying, you, because you like it, the what the main thing that you said there that I think is the inspiration that you get from it. Um, you get instruction from entering the desert, but. Right. I, I I get instruction from entering the desert, but I get inspiration from Cult of Golgotha. Like, yeah. I can't Thank say, you. like, I can say with entering the desert, I'm going to do this. But with Cult of Golgotha, I have to read what you did and say, what can I do now that I know this? You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Um, yeah, I wanted uh, my, my, my picturesque vision of when I was writing Cult of Golgotha was that each chapter that was just kind of like a, a window into a strange world that people could peek into the window and just kind of see some kind of vista of something and then hopefully either be like oh that's weird oh that's really creepy or oh that's really cool and then you know move on to the next and that's something in there they might they might have sparked their interest well it's i lay i, I laid a ton of clues all throughout culture of Gotham for figuring out so yeah. much stuff in there yeah some really interesting things like um, not at all to dumb the situation down, because what I'm going to mention is really dumbed down. But, ah, um, okay. <laughs> like, I I watch different things uh, that 
my mom and my grandma both love ancient aliens and okay. things keep yeah. popping up that I'm like in the room when they're watching that. And I'm like, he's talking about that in such a smarter way than what they're doing there. Oh, like, well, okay, cool. I feel like, right no, I feel like this guy doesn't understand like that. The guy on TV doesn't understand what the hell he's talking about, but he's going in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, and so with that said now, uh, I, I'd be interested in, do you, do you consider, uh, Vimanas, um, mm -hmm. am I, I'm saying that right. I'm uh, Vimanas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you consider sure. that to be like physically real or do you consider a Vimana to be inside of a person's head, which, or sort of inside of the greater mind? Um, and I probably it'd be good if you described what a Vimana is before you answer. <laughs> That, that's also one of the best questions that no one's ever asked me. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, because uh, I think uh, the UFO historian, David Metcalf, uh, I believe mentioned one time on his blog that, that, you know, there were instructions on how to build a Vimana in, in, within entering the desert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and there is. And so that's the, and so that's the thing. So I think the, the, the Vimana subject is just so utterly fascinating. Um, and it's very intellectually challenging to people that are coming from a uh, Newtonian, uh, uh, you know, Western linear time idea, or we could, I could technically say as, as a scholar, uh, a, a colonial <laughs> viewpoint, because that, you know, the whitewashing the history, but from an Indian historical perspective, the manas were not, were a physically real and then be uh, psychically or chronically real. And the, uh, and so, I, and so I, that there's definitely something that's going on with that that is related to um, interpen the interpenetration of dimensions or paraphoresis kind of going on there. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, too, uh, a whole different idea of what kind of meta technology some of these cultures were, were, were possessed or had tapped into it. Yeah, yeah, and like that's one of the things that I saw on that, like that I was seeing on uh, Ancient Aliens where I'm like, yeah, but no, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think one one of the one of the things that that for me is that, um, but now I'm speaking of just a, a you know a Southeast Asia concept of what we now call India, mm -hmm. which uh, which was you know the past of Southeast Asia as you know kind of a landmass, you know, f from my perspective, you know, there's no need to have aliens to explain what was achieved yeah you know all that was all that was achieved through the power the intellect the of indian culture you know and so that they they you know if they had if there were quote aliens they had been contacted through other means they didn't help them create that and, you know indian culture was able to easily create calculus uh, you know invent telescope astronomy not astrology but astronomy mm -hmm. way 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 before people were considering that yeah. uh, whole system of language which you know sanskrit is still just mind-blowingly complex yeah um, so they, they don't need any of that so i think you know but i think the western typical western mind when they only think about western systems of time or western history then they look back and all that seems either insane or crazy or impossible and then you get the little fringe concept of like, oh, you know, a ship had to fly down and give them something because there's no way, you know, like some kind of uh, 2001 you know, concept that, that you know, everything was just is kind of like animalistic evolution. But from the concept of evolution from Vedic thought, it's radically different. I mean, their concepts of time are radically different. Their concepts of space are radically different. Um, their concepts of all this types of technology are radically different. Um, yeah. So that's it. And that's in that at some point people, that it's just a whole different worldview that, that people will have to look at. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't know if I like fully picked it up the way that I should have, but to me it was like a really like a mind blowing concept because I've always so I've always felt that there's no doubt that there's aliens. Like 
other right. life forms on other places in the universe or outside right, right. of the universe like right. there's obviously other intelligent life it's just like there's no however atheist i've ever been there's no question that there's intelligent yeah. life elsewhere and i also really never felt that that intelligent life had any impact on on human civilizations uh progress i've always felt that right. maybe they were watching us maybe they weren't but we did our own thing here um yeah, yeah, yeah. nobody came here and especially nobody physically came here but right. the whole vimana thing to me i sort of saw it as like once you get to a certain sort of psychological intellectual level of of um progress like you can just sit down and meditate and then as as you really tap into in cult of golgotha then you start to talk to things or people yes, yeah. or species that are maybe they're here in like you know they're they're on a different level of of reality here on earth or yeah, maybe yeah. they're you know uh, 10 billion light years away when you're sitting down to meditate and speak with them that distance whether they're directly in front of you or whether they are 10 lifetimes worth of spaceship rides away makes no difference anymore yeah yeah no that 100 percent. that's very that's exactly what i was thinking and that's the exact idea of uh you know the rishis which were some type of enlightened seers that were literally seeing a different level of reality um and so in that that's exactly the case so the, in that situation all the limbs of yoga can be used to build a type of amana uh, and, and the yoga sutras of patanjali which is a very basic yogic text has a whole chapter or pada all about this and they'll say oh you know once you understand this you'll be able to travel to the sun you can travel to mars you can become larger you can become smaller it was very basic it wasn't it was like oh yeah 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 that that, that could happen no big deal anyway let's move on to more important topics about you know what is ignorance and what is our role in the universe and, you know things like that yeah and um so a, a, another sort of just like a weird question i have here that's just come to mind um at the end of the Ramayana, I I always yeah. like to say because I I took a I took a mythology course back in 2010 probably mm -hmm. that I thought was going to be Greek mythology, but instead we ended up reading uh, Gilgamesh, the Ramayana, a lot of oh, okay. Babylonian uh, mythology, and I was like, what the why i want to read about zeus and by the end of the semester i was like thank you so much for doing this instead like everybody yeah, already knows yeah. greek mythology and and it's at your fingertips if you don't but for yeah, somebody to yeah. force me to read the ramayana i was like thank you so much for that i would have never done that and yeah. i'm so glad i did and simultaneously to that i was right that the like two semesters after that a group of Hare Krishnas were wandering nice. through the school and were giving out a bunch of books. They're like, uh, you know, how much can you donate for this? I'm like, I am totally broke. I would love right. to read those books, but I am like, I don't have a dollar for you. I'm sorry. If you want to give me the books, go for it. And they were like, here, take this one, this one, this one. So they gave me the, yeah. um, the Bhagavad Gita, the Krishna book and the, yeah, uh, yeah. the Isopanishad book. And yeah, so yeah. I've really been, I was really felt like blessed that they gave me those books and I've like enjoyed them over the years. So that was like a total tangent. But my question is, no, um, no, that's an important, I love that story. I have a very similar story too. So. Yeah. Well, if you want to, if you want to tell it, go ahead uh, or uh, oh, well, we can get to, yeah, keep going. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So, so at the end of the Ramayana, it's sort of a star Wars battle. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, totally. And I, I like, cause I, I sort of love star star Wars and sort of hate it. And I always like to say like, the Hindus were doing these these spaceship battles like thousands of years before George Lucas came oh, along. Right. Like he, I, I, like yeah. I just like to to like rag on Lucas and be like he just stole that from the Ramayana. So yeah. my serious question then is: Were they was that Vimanas that they were using in that battle at the end of the Ramayana? Yeah, I mean typically that's what they would you we would you would think by reading that we're sure that there was some type of literal physical battle going on mm -hmm. um i think the uh the western you know slash european philosophies had a, had a you know a, a ghost of that idea with atlantis yeah 
you know, so that so that was like a it kind of it's this ambient background noise that that obviously influenced more of their cult or esoteric philosophies. But that was the idea that there was this other culture that had this greater technologies um, and greater philosophies that were doing something that was going on, you know, for sure. But particularly, that's a great question because that gives you a good example, like the concept of time in India is so much larger than what even scholars would even allow to. Um, they'll often talk about the Rig Veda being, oh, it's, you know, maybe 5,000 years old and, you know, scholars in India will just be like, laugh at them. Just be like, no, it's more like 50,000 or 100,000. I mean, yeah, that's the coolest so thing about it. It depends on where you get your history from. Some people are like, oh, that yeah. was written like, like 300 BC, and I'm like, that's not what I heard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, so it's um, it's definitely another, you know, concept with those things, and uh, I think that obviously it's very easy to use those concepts with something like ancient a ancient aliens, the Vamanas, and stuff like that. So, but that, those are always fun for some people, and, and many times for some people, that's the only way they're going to get introduced to those concepts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, like, I enjoyed everything about the Ramayana, which was my real true introduction to, to anything Hindu-related. Um, but but, but yeah. the, the battle at the end was just like, oh my god, this is awesome! Like, I told yeah, any, over, like anybody that would listen to me over the years, I've been like, have you read the Ramayana? Do you know what happens at the end of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like totally over the top. I mean, it's... it's a <clears throat> I remember as a child, I was just like, whoa. Yeah, because when I was a young a child, the Ramayana was a big influence on me. And then, because see, I was I was born in 1970, so I grew up, growing up as a child, that was the heyday of the Hare Krishna movement in America. So I remember, you know, we would, we would be driving around, and they would be on the street corners handing out flowers, full garb, yeah. and they would be in every, every airport. Oh, and, wow. And I remember... Every airport, everywhere, and I and, and then I remember I remember it very clearly. My mom was like pleading with me, like she's like, you know, I will get you any Aleister Crowley book you just want. Don't go any, to an Hare just Christians. don't be a Hari Krishna. <laughs> just don't, please, don't be a Hari Krishna. And, and I'll never forget. I came home from uh, uh, college one Christmas or something, and uh, she, she said, "Oh, I've got I got a, your Christmas one of your Christmas presents. I can give it to you early. It's this it's this new book called Monkey on a Stick." And it was a it was a very a very important book talking about the problems in the Hare Krishna movement. There was, you know, and at that time the, it was it was all over like 2020 and 60 Minutes and all this stuff. And, you know, so but, uh, but the Hare Krishna movement and their books and the imagery they, that once again they would give me all those things as a child. They would come up to me and say, "Here, just take all our books, take all this." So that's how I was initially, you know, exposed to the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then the Easter Yopanishad, all those things, things, the thing for me, for me too. And and actually, a very influential book for me as a child was uh, uh, Prabhupada's Travels to Other Planets, small little pamphlet. And I still have it. I've got about I collect uh, versions of it. I've got about fifteen different versions. And it was basically him just kind of like parading the, the materialistic sciences, saying like, "Listen, you fools, the Vedas. We've been going to other planets." For thousands of years, and we've built pamanas, and we we have much more complex concepts uh, of, of, of kind of quantum physics than, than your you know very mediocre ideas about time and space. Big deal that you went to the moon. Who even cares? Yeah. Um, and I remember and Prabhupada at that time, which is quite an interesting. You know, this is um, you know was questioning whether or not we even really went to the moon, which is really funny because now that actually is. A whole group of people doing that but back then probably was like how do we know that's even true just because you saw it on tv how do you know that really happened and so as a kid that was that was i really thought that was well let me place. let me throw in my version of that here real quick so here's what i think happened i think we went to the moon exactly when we said we were going to the moon and i think all that happened but there was no way of getting the footage correct. So they, after they did it, they were like, this footage is trash. So they went to Stanley Kubrick and they were like, hey, Stanley Kubrick, can you hook us up with some better footage? And then he was like, I got you. <laughs> so yeah, but, so I mean, again, there's, I there's... think like, I think the reality and the conspiracy theory are both true. <laughs> those, those I, I'm like a meet them like... halfway with like a lot of things. <laughs> that's well, that's, that's how most things are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, and, Most things uh, are a little bit of both. 
Yeah. So, um, so this was, this is actually, I wasn't expecting it to be such a smooth transition. Um, but you, so now I wanted to move into the tantric physics and, um, nice. sort nice. of the first thing that I wanted to, well, a couple of things here and they sort of can go together and we'll hop right into both of them. Um, so yeah. Do you, uh, before I say it, do you want people to figure out for themselves what this Sanskrit is, or can I go ahead and say? <laughs> oh, you can tell them. No, go ahead and tell them. Okay, sure. so because I didn't know at first, and it took me like, it took me until like three days ago, which is a week after I finished reading it, to actually know specifically what the cover was. So now right, I right, know right. this is the Maha Mantra. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, and so, as I said, I got I read the Ramayana back in like 2010, and so yeah, I, I yeah. had I did the Maha Mantra for the first time like at least a decade ago. Um, That's and, so beautiful. And I, I've rec I've done it many times. Um, as I I listened to a Sad Guru video, he said, "You don't you don't speak it, you don't you don't recite it, you chant it." So I chanted Yo, the right. Maha Mantra. Uh, a decade ago because somebody was like yeah it's just like the the resonations of the word it, you don't don't think about what it means don't think about the religion just do it and i'm like okay yeah. i like meditation yeah. i'm just gonna do it so there's been numerous times throughout my life that i've uh chanted the maha mantra either out loud or in my head and so again this is like coming to your book it was like okay things are coming together for me here on this you know what i mean so um that's actually that's really beautiful i'm really i'm really glad you shared that story because that does kind of even show you the mysterious power of that mantra yeah yeah absolutely and um so so uh speak a little bit on the importance of the maha mantra as a whole and the importance of the maha mantra in relation to your book the tantric physics one and two sure. absolutely what that's a, such a beautiful question too yeah the maha mantra is, is considered to be the most important mantra for our age of the Kali Yuga, that during this age um, of troubled time, that many of the traditional ways of either A, weren't going to work anymore, or or B, were just so complex and hard that most people wouldn't be able to do it, um, or three, people would just work and they didn't have the education to do it. So the they would say, so don't worry about that, just do the Maha Mantra. And it was literally how you just phrased it was very well done. It's like, don't worry about the religion part of it. Don't worry about what it means. It's just the actual sound vibration of this. Uh, it is literally a sound vibration of Krishna. Just say it, sing it, feel it, and, you know, do it. And so that was something for me as a child, too, like growing up that I was that really influenced me. Um, and so as a child, I did the Maha Mantra constantly. Um, and that's why I even put it on the put it on the cover of the book was because it was kind of a homage to what I felt uh, deeply changed my life as a child, but then also formed who I was at this time. Well, you know, and, and that's a big part of the, the tantric system. Although people often don't think of Vaishnava systems as tantric, they do have tantric strict sex within Vaishnava, the Sahajaya system particularly. And so that was a big part of that in my relationship to how Krishna teaches us and uh, Christian Radha being an example of the cosmic Shakti, uh, you know, kind of morphing people, changing people, helping people grow. So that's why it was there for that too. And just for it, and even just the, the concept also is very important too, is that just the actual, the, just the actual uh, physical presence of it can be powerful. Like just seeing the actual mantra or having the, the, the mantra on something is very powerful because it's like actually having the body of Krishna and Radha there with you. So I wanted that to be something that when people had that book, that they, they were having some kind of resonance of, of Krishna and Radha in, in their life. Yeah, and okay, so if you don't mind, um, I'm just going to hold this thing up here, and will you recite it? One, would you mind reciting it one time for us? Because I think people probably don't know what we're talking about, but when they hear it, they're going right. to be like, oh, I know what you're talking about. Is that okay yeah, with you? Yeah, they mostly think, yeah, most of the time when you say the Maha Mantra, they're not, they don't know because there's thousands of mantras, and there's and sometimes different sects have a Maha Mantra for their sex, but it's Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. Yeah, so that's that's the traditional one. And then, and, but there's different nuances. The different sects have different ver kind of versions of that. Mm -hmm. 
which are which are very beautiful, but that's the traditional one, which I thought would be the most important one to put in. Yeah, and so, okay, and so I knew that mantra as connect as being connected to the Hare Krishnas. Like I remember, like people almost making fun of Hare Krishnas, like yeah, yeah. Uh, like the the sect, the Hare Krishna sect. Um, yeah. as like people made fun of this whole thing and it's like oh look at them singing their song and mm -hmm. um and then krishna as a whole i was of the opinion was directly connected specifically to the Hare krishna movement i was all confused sure. on this stuff and so if yeah. i i think i'm right That's about this Har krishna is a version of vishnu right or wrong yes right. yeah yeah it's an avatar depending on who you ask um it's an avatar of Vishnu. Okay, and so uh, so but, I thought that it was an avatar of Vishnu specific to the Hare Krishna sect. So if you right. can, like, whatever you could maybe say to clear that up for myself and other people. I think it's already more or less cleared up for me, but other people that might be on yeah. the same line of thinking, what could you say to say, like, what is your version of Krishna that you talk about so much in this book? And how is does that differ from the Hare Krishna sect's version of Krishna? Yeah, I mean, then that's a very good question. And it's understandable that people would think that because the Hare Krishna movement in many ways defines what most people in the, the, the European or Western world knows as Krishna. Mm -hmm. and they, that's, that's one of the most beautiful things about Ishkan is they brought Krishna consciousness to, into the world. And before that, it was almost like Krishna was just another deity on the wall of, mm -hmm. of this, you know, 330 million gods up there. And then, you know, when Prabhupada was vision, when he came over, so that's very powerful. It's very beautiful that he did that, but it's not exclusive to the Ishtan movement. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be equal. That would be equal to saying that, you know, Jesus Christ or, or, or Mary is exclusive only to the Catholic church and to only have access to that. You'd have to be a Catholic. So you don't have to be a Hare Krishna to be access to Krishna and Radha. Well, uh, let me ask you know, this that, a little bit a differently point. as well, though. So your your explanation of Krishna was much darker, I'll say, and yeah. also much more connected to other gods and and uh, and the whole greater uh, Hindu situation and when mm -hmm. you the the thing that i got from from a little bit of research onto the hari krishna movement was that mm -hmm. they sort of were trying to make krishna jesus and so krishna yeah. seemed like a very light a very like just a beautiful beautiful figure that everything was light and beauty and and like special and nice and mm -hmm. like then like you're like the thing that i've read through your book is not that it's it is but it's there's so much more to it and so much dark darker elements to it than that yeah so yeah i mean that's why you know no that's once again that's another wonderful question that no one's really asked about um that is very true and i think that i mean because that, that's been one of the challenges uh for a lot of people when they encounter ishkan and so you'll even you'll even hear people say things like, "Oh, Hari Krishnas." Do you mean the Hari Christians? Because yeah. they kind of were kind of they were kind of almost you know turning the Sanatana Dharma into some kind of Abrahamic path. Mm -hmm. That's what it seemed, and then that's a that's a valid question, you know. And so, and I, I think that that's a challenge. But I think. So, and you're right in some ways that Krishna was a very approachable deity to transplant into the Western European world with that concept. However, I would probably flip it in the sense that, you know, people coming from India uh, already knew that Krishna predated the, the Jesus stories way, way, way long time. Yeah. That most of the Jesus, most of the Jesus myth seems to be taken from Krishna. Not the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, which, which which is very troubling to a lot of people on the on another way. Yeah, you know? but uh, you know, but uh, Krishna is also too a very mischievous god and a very challenging god, and you know that's what. Uh, it, I, and I write a lot about this in poetic form and poetry. I, I tend to write about this more in poetry than I do prose mm -hmm. um, for a lot of reasons. But you know, Krishna's flute can be either sugar or it can be poison. 
depending mm. on your mindset, <clears throat> depending on where you are. And also, you know, depending on what world you're living in, you know, from a completely secularized, materialistic world, Krishna can seem like a demon. But for someone who is a spiritual practitioner, Krishna can seem like an angelic form. And there's also a very important connection between Krishna and Mahakali. Yeah. You know, Krishna. And Ka- yeah, there's definitely, you know, some there's some things going on there. Uh, which is very important for people to understand. Uh, and so, so Krishna is very radical, antinomian deity as well. And there's a lot of connection between Krishna and Shiva, uh, which are very, very important. Yeah, and so that's a great, again, this is like, you're making this way too easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was going to be one of my next questions here is, um, okay, so Kal like, that was another mis- misunderstanding that I saw in people that I that I think were were talking about your book that hadn't read your book, and they yeah, were saying like it seems like uh they they basically were like saying like how come this isn't just like a Vaishnava thing and they're like you you're trying to make this out to be a tantra thing like where's Kali in this where and it's like did you read it Kali's definitely in this. And oh, it's all of the goddesses in there, yeah. Yeah, and so so my a specific question I have is, um, is Kali an overarching term for the um, the 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 ten uh, Dasha Mahavidyas, or is yeah. I mean I know Kali is one of the ten, but is Kali sort of also an overarching term? Or is it, is it, no, whenever you say Kali, you're specifically talking about the one version? Yeah, from the, from the traditions that I was initiated into, and I'm glad you brought that up, because the, the, the whole system of, of tantric physics, in the sense of my book, tantric physics, mm-hmm. is all based on the Dasha Mahavid. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's, it. that's the key. Yeah, that's why I was just like, somebody like, said, like, oh, how come that's not in there? And I'm like, uh, it is? <laughs> it's, it's the entire book. And yeah. in, in, in many ways, the entire book is just a revelation of the goddess. That's oh, that's exactly what it is. And so that's particular with that. So in the traditions that I was initiated with, the Dasha Mahavidyas were emanation outside, would emanate out of Kali. Um, okay. And then also, too, and also, too, the traditions that I was initiated into, the, the, the Dasha Mahavidyas were emanations of Sri Radha. Okay. And so, you know, Krishna and Radha were the alchemical root, and then the, the you know, Kali and the Dasha Mahavidyas morphed out of that, um, which is very esoteric things. And I laid hints throughout the book about that. But, um, yeah, and really, out throughout all three of, of your books, people... you've laid hints to that. Yes. Yes, I have extensively. And I'll, I often say that to people. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. If you would just read the book, you would see that that's in there. But a lot of people these days don't read book. I mean, it really is. That's a big sign of the Kali Yuga. People just don't read anymore. Yeah. And when I, they do, I've, they, I've they seen, speed, people speed things, read. Like you know, they, my... people want to say, oh, I, I can, I can read like a whole book in a night. And it's like, but did you understand it? I know that that whole speed reading thing drives me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, I, I don't I, know I how hilarious comments on my book. I remember one comment, some, some person said something like, Oh, this is just another Ishkon piece of propaganda. And, and I thought it was hilarious. I've, I'm completely never been a member of Ishkon. Yeah. Ishkon would probably, it, I, as I've often jokingly said, Ishkon would call me a demonic. Yeah. It and so for people that don't know, when you say Ishkan, you're, this is more or less the Hare Krishna sect, like mm-hmm. same, same situation well, I, there for people that don't, that aren't following that. The Hare Krishna movement. that. It's Ishkan just not what you're been, doing though. Right. Exactly. I have great love and respect for Ishkan, um, but his, but it has never been my particular path. So, you know, I've just, I've had different traditions, which I've been involved with, um, within, within India, much older traditions. And I, and I was also much more interested in the actual studies of the Rig Veda, going way, way back to the primordial um, of that. Yeah. Um, and so that, and so that's that. That's also throughout my book as well too. So if a lot of people don't have <clears throat> training or a little bit of knowledge of Vedic concepts, then they, they, they get a lot of things mixed up as well too. They don't understand. Well, uh, and but, but in the book, I, I made a point of explaining a lot of that. 
Yeah, and 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 I think like in in the first in the other two books, in Entering the Desert and um, Cult of Golgotha, you were alluding to these uh, to to I think if I'm if I gathered this correctly, I wasn't sure what you meant necessarily in Entering the Desert. Then it started to become clear with Cult of Golgotha, and then I got to Tantric Physics, and I'm like, okay, I was following this right. So like, you yep, mentioned yep. you'll mention like the Dark Lord, and it's like who is this dark lord okay that's krishna and you would say like yeah. the dark goddess and yeah. it's like okay who's this dark goddess and then it's like okay that's kali and then it's yeah, like absolutely. okay so what about the other goddesses and then like you break that down as like the 10 dasha mahavidyas and it's so that's why i was like but so like the dark goddess is kali but the dark goddess is also sort of like an overarching thing like that's what that's yeah, what I was kind of saying with the 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 ten Dasha Mahavidyas, and I think you kind of did answer that. Like, it is sort of like this is Kali, but this is also all these other goddesses, but it's really all Kali. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting concept. We can, you know, because we struggle to find linguistic terms to explain some of these concepts, um, and it, of course, now Sanskrit is it, it's very effective because it has its own linguistic infrastructure within there. Which, you know, so. But if someone doesn't know that, then we struggle with words. Or if we know it, but we're struggling with words translated to English. But I think we can look at Kali and Christian Rudd as like a holographic, you know, doorway. And depending on how you look at it, how you enter it, different facets of it will be revealed. Yeah. And to the limited intellect that can only see certain things. Um, they're only going to see certain parts of it, but the Dasha Mahavidya system is just beautiful and mind blowing in its scope of expression, of the diversity and the complexity of Shakti and its revelation in the cosmos and, of course, on Earth and in her mind. Yeah. And so this is sort of like a more direct question that you might not want to answer, but I'd kind of like to ask it anyway. What are the black sure. bees of Kali? Oh, that's really, you're asking the best questions that anyone's ever asked me. <laughs> Thank the, you. The, the, black bees of, <laughs> the black bees of Kali are... Oh no, hold up. Um, uh, give me one second. Okay, now we're back. All right, good. There we go. Yeah. The black bees of Kali are... It's a very it's a very important concept that to me in the book I wanted related to the concept of a chinta beta beta vada, the concept of simultaneous unity and diversity. Okay. And so you know, and so it's a very con it's a very complex theological concept, but it, but we can explain it the idea that from the perspective from a tantric perspective of this and from a Vaishnava perspective that there is this very mysterious relationship that we have with the cosmic mind, the dark Lord and the dark mother of being simultaneously connected to them, but also simultaneously separate from them. Yeah. And, and that is a very, you know, most people think about it as either it's like, they're just, they're just a drop of water that goes into the ocean and they're just nothingness, the void. But this concept is pushing it further, is saying, yes, that's part of it. Then the drop of water pops back out, and then it drops back in, then it pops back out, and then it drops back in. And so Newtonian physics, of course, says, well, that's impossible. That can't happen. You know, but we know with quantum physics, we say, well, is it a particle or is it a wave? Well, it's both. Depends on, how, depends on what you're measuring, depends on who's looking at it, depends on who wants it. And yeah, so uh, a, Foolish Fish did an absolutely amazing video explaining that concept where like what it's it's just it's everywhere. But then when you look at it, it's right there. But when you're not looking at it, it's everywhere. But if you look at it yes. again, it's right there. And it's like yep. that broke down this like huge scientific concept in like a 20 minute video. So, um, yeah, I, Foolish, Foolish Fish is Wonderful. awesome. And uh, he, he's done a lot to help me understand some of these really complex things in like a few moments notice. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. But that is the idea that so that Black Beast of Kali is, is a, a, a kind of an esoteric teaching that's related to that cool so I'll, I'll leave the rest of the more of it's related to inner teaching but that's essentially the idea that it's hinting at this concept of this mysterious kind of morphing of simultaneous unity and diversity which is constantly always happening 
Yeah, and so since we're talking about Tantra, I think, like, a thing that, that needs to be discussed, which I'd rather just not even mess with it, but I still think it's necessary, like... I don't know if you know much about Nicholas Shrek, and I don't need to go into any detail on him specifically, but oh, you, you, right. and, you and him are the two people that speak about Tantra that basically say, like, ignore everything else that everybody's saying in the West. They're getting it all wrong. <laughs> you need to focus on Eastern traditions and ignore all of this bullcrap. Because when yeah. people in the West say Tantra, like, if you Google, if you, like, if you go to YouTube and type in Tantra, you're going to get a bunch of like, what? Th what? This is I'm... not what they just had an hour conversation about. This is like, uh... this is just like sex stuff. And so I yeah. want to say, like, I read your whole book and I don't think you mentioned the word sex a single time in the entire tantric physics book. So how are people so like, where is the separation coming from? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, and it's very, that's also very nuanced too, because uh, it, that's a very complex subject. But like, for example, we can look at the, the West and so, or, you know, America or Europe and so what Nicholas Streck is talking about is that most people's, their conception of Tantra is they're seeing as some type of sexual experience and, you know, then they'll quote some, some, you know, ridiculous musician or, you know, some kind of pop star who talks about it. And, uh, and that it's only that and it's about, you know, or then maybe, maybe, maybe we get, you know, some kind of concept from some kind of like magic with a K and they'll talk about sex magic and then it kind of borderlines into that. And so I think they get caught up into those things. And, the, and then, the, you know, that sex is a very provocative topic for people, but it's also a topic which scares a lot of people. Uh, but then in India, there's there, there's also a problem in India too, because in India, depending on many cultural factors, they've tried to cut off all of that from tantra to the point where you'll see people in India saying like, "Oh, tantra has nothing to do with sex. It never did. Yeah, That's it, a lie." Just to cut it, you it, off it here, totally real has, quick, um, in, in terms yeah, yeah, of in terms of the term linga. Um, that was one of the mm -hmm. things where, uh, like, when you, you go to the Linga statues in India and people are like, oh, this yeah. has nothing to do with sex. And it's like, um, that is a representation of the male reproductive yeah. organ. And if you are going yeah. to ignore that, you're ignoring basically the majority of what this means. Yeah. So we have a problem there, too. You know, and, but I, I think from their perspective, um, they're just trying to protect and stop something from being cheapened. And from being watered down, which I completely understand. Yeah. And and then the West, the West. So, the, so there, it's a, that's what I'm saying. It's very nuanced. But tantra has sexual aspects to it, just like Ayurveda does. Ayurvedic medicine has a whole called Vajra, Vajrakarana, the whole sexual rejuvenation system, because they understood that people's sexual health was very important for life. Yeah. It was very important for the production of a family and healthy children. You know. So there's not there, there there's no problem with that. And of course, you can look at the you know many paintings and temples that have beautiful, you know, sexual images in India. And so they're fine with it. Um, but I think the problem is when it just gets deepened to just that. Yeah. Um, it's so much, it's so much more than just that. Um, and it, which I think is, is interesting, but I think we could say the same about the concept of quote, the left hand path. Yeah. The vomitaria, you know, people say, what is the left hand path? If you ask some people, they're like, Oh, crazy Satanism. And, antinomian you know whatever then in india it means nothing it just means it's, it's a, you know so we get these terms and they people start making up their own definitions and they don't know the original definitions and they don't know the nuances and so it can get very confusing really quickly yeah absolutely um <clears throat> so uh let's see here sorry i um but I think it's more than that, and it's that slow, too. People just tend to overly focus on something, you know, on, on anything. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I, I need to take a break here really quick. Um, I drank yeah. way too much coffee today yeah, no uh, so what i want to do is to play a little bit of music here for a moment um me and you are going to hop off the screen for five minutes we're going to play music Perfect. for five minutes and i want to
All right, I'm hopping back in here now. Um, thank you guys for taking a break there for a minute. Um, I like to throw a little break in either way, but usually we go to dark ambient. But I was like trying to think like, what can what can we put here in the middle? But um, I was like, okay, I'll just go back to Mahapralaya for a few minutes there. Nice. So um, <laughs> yeah. So I I think. I, I know this is a topic that you've talked about a good bit already, um, and you, but it's a huge part of Tantric Physics 1, and I think we should really discuss it some. Um, the, the topic of the guru and how yeah, it is yeah. really a necessity, and um, you know that's, that's a thing that I think is controversial to some people, annoying to other people, but for a lot of yeah. people, it's an absolute essential necessity. So, um, wh why, like in, in short, why is it so necessary and, and what are people getting wrong when they think that you don't need one? Yeah, that's just, it's such an inflammatory question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something also too, I've seen people comment on my books and I, I've had people write me and say, you know, does, you know, does your book say that you need a guru? If so, I don't even want to read it. You know, it's just that, yeah. I get that all the time. I, I'm just like, oh, okay. Well, um, you know, and there, it's a, also a very nuanced question, but I think that the different ways we can think about it, you know, from an Eastern perspective, from the Vedic perspective, the guru is a line of succession, the parampara, where this transmission is being filtered and handed and like literally channeled down. Mm -hmm. So it has a very important esoteric link. It's like a link in a chain back to the primordial path. Um, much like the concept in Gnostic or Christian ideas of the apostolic succession, right? That's a very simple yeah. concept. But this, but this takes it even further. This is like they're saying like that this, you know, connects you back. So then one way it's connecting you back to this esoteric lineage. And then the other aspect is that those, the people who were the gurus in these systems were incredibly educated. They were extremely knowledgeable about scriptures, the nuances of the tradition. And in theory, in theory, they had been someone who had, who had, had realized a state of consciousness themselves and could somehow kind of, place a spark of that or ignite a spark of that into something yeah now, and of course that you know that's the, that's the original concept of that. yeah and so like you and and nicholas shrek and greg kaminsky are the three names that i know most you know most uh directly in the western world that speak on this topic and all three of you guys are like absolutely in that camp of saying there this has to happen if it doesn't happen there you could get to a certain point but once you get to that point this is the this is the bridge that you need to cross at some point there's right, there's right. a day that's going to come that you're going to have to cross this bridge um so right so i guess like my question is then um is it something that you should seek out or is it something that you should just uh there's something there's things that you should do on your own and wait for it to naturally happen yeah, that's another good question, too. I think, uh, you know, I always say that, you know, the goddess chose me and Krishna chose me. I didn't choose them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all the gurus that I've had and still have, have have all come to me Yeah. Uh, in, 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 in some ways. But then I'm also I have taken the step toward them as well, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they, can, they just because something comes to you. <clears throat> doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to either listen to it or that you're necessarily going to pay attention to it. You know, a lot of times people have things come in their lives and they just, they didn't either see it, they didn't acknowledge it or they didn't want to acknowledge it. And then it moves on. So I think a little bit of both, I think um, that people, you know, have to, you know, spontaneously let things happen, but then they also have to kind of look for it too. Um, I, I, <laughs> Sometimes it gets frustrating talking about this in the sense that I sound like a grumpy old man because I, I start talking about how it was for me when I was young, but I literally grew up in another world. Yeah. I mean, I literally grew up in a, I don't think a lot of people even now realize this. Like I grew up with no internet, with no iPhone, with no access to the books we, ha we have. Yeah. When I finally got old enough to go to college, 
I was able to get the Nag Hammadi scriptures on microfiche by an interlibrary loan in the basement of Louisiana State University, scrolling through a fit. You know, now you can just like Google it on uh, Amazon or go, you know, go out and get a thing. So, yeah, um, it was very hard to get these things. Um, and when I studied Chinese medicine, I had to teach myself medical Chinese to be able to read some of the text. And now the textbooks are just mind boggling that I see them produced. It, 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 it's so beautiful. So in theory, in theory, we should, see, we, due to the access to the materials, we should be seeing this, just like a massive explosion of, of, of people learning this and a massive explosion, but we're not, we don't see that. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a strange thing. So I hear when people, my point in saying this is when people say like, how can I find a guru? Or it's like, it's the, my God, these days you could find a guru in two minutes on the internet. Yeah. For two minutes using, you know, and I'm consistently mind blown um, at how technology connects us these days. I always have some kind of experience at least once a month where I'll have a conversation with someone or connect with some via my iPhone that is just mind boggling to me that, that we're able to, you know, that in the past would have never happened or would have taken months and months or, you know, something like that. Now, the flip side to that is that we also have a bunch of shit. You know, that the technology is also just kind of like a huge this blender of a bunch of crap. And so people have to, and the flip side, now they have to filter through a bunch of crap. Yeah. So that's another reason why it's important to have mentors or teachers to group because they help us filter through this crap that we have to experience. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a, it's a mixed bag, right? It's a very, it's a, it's a total mixed bag. Um, well, so the way that I, I thought that you, I thought that, that you're re, through reading it, I mean, really, I'm asking this question for viewers that haven't read the book, because you answer a lot of this in the book. Um, and I think, I think you go into a lot of detail that makes sense to me um, in ways that didn't make sense before, where I sort of was oh, more in that camp of saying like, yeah, it's easy to say you, you got to find a guru if you've already found a guru, but what if you haven't found one, then you got to go find one. And that's, that's right. can be, can, <laughs> right, maybe, right. maybe that's impossible for me, but you know, and you, yeah. you point out a lot of really good reasoning. Um, but I like in the, the cave of Hridaya, Her- Her- I think, um, the cave uh-huh. of Hridaya uh-huh. ritual. I like that you yep. say in there, like, if you have a guru, you use your guru for this ritual. If you don't have one, you pick one of the greats from history and you work the ritual and and that's going to put you in a position to find one that much more easily and then yeah, um yeah. in one of your previous interviews that i watched I th- i'm pretty sure this was you maybe it was somebody else but i i think I, basically what i heard was um do the maha mantra uh read the bhagavad gita and just wait and see what happens you know, and yeah, and if you yeah. are if you're dedicated, then you just need to keep doing the mantra and keep reading. You know, keep doing your reading, and and sooner or later, if if it's right for you, it's going to happen. And if it's not, it's not. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I one I one hundred percent agree with that. Which um, that <clears throat> that idea alone upsets a lot of people, but that is definitely my approach on that, and that's why I often say to most people, um, you know, maybe you know. Hinduism or the Eastern path is not necessarily your path. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. You, you know, that, you know, that if they have to feel called for it, they have to feel called to it. Um, and then they have to do a lot of work. But even if we take it outside of, we drop it a level outside of the mystified category of the guru and just say, well, okay, if you don't want a guru, then you at least need a teacher. Yeah. You at least need a men. You at least need a mentor with someone helping guiding you in the thing. Um, and that that's a big, that's a big concept too. So um, I have a question here, and I you might this is this might go nowhere, but are are you familiar with this book by chance, The Journeys in the Kali Yuga by Aki Cederberg? I have not read it. I have not read it. Okay, so I would recommend that you read that. Um, I I think just not that you'd learn anything from it necessarily, but I think you'd really enjoy the narrative. So, um, oh, really? I know Aki because of uh, he was part of the Oral Hypnox uh, dark dark ritual ambient group some years back. Oh, wonderful! So, um, that's how I was familiar with his name. But basically, this book is about uh, he went to India to um. God, I can't remember the name of it. What's that massive festival that they have there? The massive... Uh, Kumbh Mela. 
Yes, the yes, Kumba the Mela. Kumba the Kumba Mela. He went he went there one year and this sort of like this book sort of narrates him like finding his guru and then going to the Kumba Mela and he was going to be initiated into something uh, and basically he backed out at the last minute and said like I'm basically he was like I'm not Indian so I'm going back to Finland and and picking back up my Finnish uh religion ah, which okay. it's a very very interesting and i don't really you know it's i think to each their own i don't necessarily think that's yeah, the right yeah. or the wrong thing to do but um i i thought it was an interesting concept of of how how that happened and i think it it, it fits a lot into the way that you you know you say like I am a, a Hindu first and foremost, and yet you've done the Cult of Golgotha book that that really lays out for yeah. us how you know the um the the uh, hoodoo voodoo sort of thing comes into into your work, sure. uh, your past sure. your past understanding of Catholicism and all of these things come mm -hmm. into your work. Um, again, like it, you have to lay a foundation somewhere, and but again, also with Aki, you have to have a guru. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so yeah, yeah I don't know important. that there's really a question in that, but I, if you had read it, I was interested to see what you had to say. But if you hadn't, I just think it's an interesting book to read. Um, yeah, no, that so I, I do very, recommend that, sounds, that. It sounds very interesting, and, and that's something I, I often talk about because you know Rudolf Steiner was of that opinion, and Carl Jung was of that opinion. And both Rudolf Steiner and Carl Jung were actually most of the time discouraged people from journeying to the East mm -hmm. because they said that you're just not going to be set for it. You're not psychologically set for it. It's not your heritage. It's not your, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever verbiage the system had that they wanted to use. And mm -hmm. what I think they meant was you, they, these people were not raised in a worldview that could accept that or understand that because to understand the Vedic system requires a radical reorientation of consciousness. Yeah. It really does. And, but, and, but I've seen this when I was both teaching and when I was in medical school learning Chinese medicine. Because when I went to Chinese medicine, when I went to Ayurvedic medicine, I had already studied extensively Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, Indian theology, Qigong, martial arts, Kung Fu. So my mindset was just like, oh, this is another limb of that system yeah. that I'm specializing in. But many of my classmates or many of the students I was teaching had nothing of that background. So they couldn't understand anything. They had no reference point. It was so hard for them. Now, some of them figured it out. But I clearly remember many times both the Ayurvedic teachers from India and the Chinese medical teachers from China would, would be very blunt with students and say, you should just quit. You're not going to get this. Yeah. And the students would often would always be hurt. They'd be mad. They'd be angry. But the teachers were very innocent in their comment. They were like, "Oh, I don't mean to hurt your feelings. You should just be something else." Yeah, yeah. You know? And I think and, um, I think it depends a lot on where you're from and what you're, as you're saying, like what your past experiences are. Um, like for Aki, with like if you're coming from a place that has an ancient tradition and your family is part of that ancient tradition, then you should really take that into consideration. But if, if you're somebody like me that we just landed on Catholicism, it wasn't like my family has a history with Catholicism. It's just like, well, there's right, a Catholic right. church down the street. Let's go try that one. Um, and right. so, and I was only in there for like, you know, five years. And so I say that right. was my thing, but it, there's no like deep connection that I have to it. So like, as just a random American wandering through the world, whatever I feel strong, most strongly connected to really could come from anywhere because I have no basis to, to work on, you know, there's no right. like right. running ancient tradition in my family. So, um, I think maybe that might be the same sort of thing that you're saying where it's like, I fit into this. It didn't, it didn't clash with what I already thought of the world. And therefore I was able to do it. Whereas some other person might say, I already have all of this baggage and I need to focus more on what that means to me than, than bringing this new thing in. Yes. It's very important. And sometimes I, I, I find it challenging to, um, to give people advice on this because I don't really think I had a choice. So for me, as the experiences I had as a child, 
I had some radical experiences as a child, and then I went into this. And so it's just what I was given in this karmic path in this lifetime. Mm-hmm. I, it, it wasn't something that was that I struggled with, right? See, I, I never, I, I never struggled with, oh, what do I believe? Uh, what, what is my place in the world? You know, these kind of concepts, which are very important concepts. And I don't, this is not coming from some kind of like, I'm sure some people will listen to this and say, oh, this sounds very arrogant. But it's actually the exact opposite. It's not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying like, I was just so young and I had experiences and this just kind of was dropped into me and that's just what my path was. Yeah. If you looked, if you looked at what I was studying when I was 13, 14, 15 years old and today, it's literally the same thing. I'm just, I'm just, older now and doing it because i've been studying it. Mm-hmm. but all that whether it was whether it was kung fu running hinduism chinese medicine all that was already starting there and so uh, sometimes I, it's, it's challenging to tell you know give people advice if they didn't feel that connection but i do always tell people if you don't feel a draw from your heart don't do it, it, it you know so that was interesting to hear that book saying at the last moment, he said, you know what? This isn't for me. Yeah. And I really respect that. I really respect that. And I think that's very important. And people should, should need to read that and hear those stories because that is very important for us to listen to that inner voice and to honor it and, and, and to hone it and to know why they're doing that. Yeah. And so because something that might, fast. something that might still be sort of along that same line, um, I, this is sort of a general question that I, I was curious about. Um, I, I think that a lot of people that that follow a Hindu tradition, um, just in general, especially Indians, um, probably take it the same way that that oh, everybody that went to my Catholic church took it. Like there were like ten percent hardcore devout Catholics, and the rest of them were just going to church. And so, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. where where is the line between I am just a general Hindu and like because you have a lot of warnings in your books mm-hmm. throughout all three mm-hmm. of your books like don't just play with this if you're gonna do this know what you're doing and follow the steps don't hop into this part don't think you know that thing like do it the mm-hmm. way that it should be done follow the steps they are in place for a reason um yeah what what separates the way that you are presenting your work from just saying oh i'm a hindu i do hindu things i I do this ritual sometimes some days i forget yeah that's a very smart and actually beautiful question Uh, because because when we look at something like hinduism there's so many uh it's a cultural thing right just it's the entire culture Mm mm-hmm and so they, they, it's something they, a world they grew up in, they just take for granted and like anything. But that's actually a very good, a very good um, connection to Catholicism in Louisiana. I remember growing up and these, these like beautiful rituals and magical things. And, and particularly for me, what always resonated as a child and as a young person was the sacrament. Yeah. Right. You know, that, that, that was always very mystical. And I was raised very liberal Lutheran. So my family was very liberal Lutheran and I was sent to Catholic schools and my parents were encouraged me to do whatever I want. So I had a very creative and beautiful environment to grow up in. Yeah. But the Lutheran, the the Lutheran church, whether it was conservative or liberal, that's a very technical theological reasoning for that. Um, Or Catholic, they, they both agreed on the sacrament. Yeah. And when we say the sacrament for people that don't understand, we mean like eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ. Right, right. So they agreed on that. So when I, so, and that that was made very clear to me as a child, like, okay, if, you know, if you can take communion uh, uh, on Sunday at your Lutheran church, but since you believe the same things, you can also take communion when you go to school. Mm -hmm. And I, and and that was a big thing. And so, so that was always something I understood. Oh, so I, would already, I was already thinking about these these things, and I would notice that when I would go to communion, uh, and most particularly, I, I always cite this in interviews that one of the most important figures in my life, the development of spirituality, was my mother. Mm. And, and so to see her devotion to her spiritual path as a child was just mind 
Bolt Bible. And even to this day, it's just mind by it. Her approach to the sacrament when she would go take communion, it was just, it was, it was so intense for me as a child, you know. So then I kind of assumed that approach. But then I started to see in Catholic schools, like, oh, most people aren't even taking it seriously. Yeah. For most people, most people, it was just like, whatever. They were just laughing as they took it. And I remember um, a, a very, it was actually a life-changing moment for me. I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I'm, so I was a sophomore in high school, which would have been, what, 16, 15, 16? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And but I was on a break <clears throat> from a class, and we had, in my Catholic school, there was a large, uh, kind of like a, a small area, like a mall in the middle of where the classes where everyone met at between classes, but that was also transformed into a church for mass and they had a small little area like a portable place where they kept the youth uh, and some students had broken into that and were some senior students had broken into that and were like eating the, the communion and joking with it and yeah. the, the head of the, the head of the, the uh, i'll never forget it dr bollock the doctor of theology uh, who was also a deacon came out and taught them yeah and i was just sitting there studying watching this happen and he just went just total berserk. Yeah. And, you know, gra grabbed them both by the neck. I've never seen anyone, you know, he was so physical. He was a rather large guy, like grabbed him by the neck and like, you know, physically dragged him to the, to the office and screamed at him. And then he, he knew me and he, he was the head of the theological department and he saw me and he said, Mr. William, Mr. Williams, will you please come assist him? And I was just sitting there, and so I went over there, and he and the Eucharist had fallen all over the ground. Mm -hmm. And so he, he asked, he said, please hold the plate. And so I just held the plate as he picked up each Eucharist, blessed it, consumed it, blessed it, consumed it, and then they then they just kind of put it back on there and put it in there. And then he said, okay, he was just like almost crying. Yeah. You know? and then he went back to class. And then at the end of the day, because I had class with Dr. Bullock at the last class. He asked all the students in the class, what is your, what is our definition of the Eucharist? What is our definition of the Eucharist? What is our definition of the Eucharist? And of course, none of the students, they're like, whatever, I don't know. It's breath. And he said, and so then he does this to embarrass me. He said, Mr. Williams, the Lutheran in the back, will you please tell me the definition of the Eucharist? And he knew that as Lutheran, I was like, I had to go to catechism. I had to learn, you know, yeah. so I recited the definition. He was like, everyone should be ashamed that a Lutheran knows more than you on the Eucharist. And then after class, he's like, I hope you don't mind that I did that, but I, but thank you so much for helping. But that don't, that, I don't think he even realized it, nor I realized it, how much that would change my perception of the sacraments. Yeah. The same thing, you know, there was, and that's a very, the sacraments predate Christianity. Mm -hmm. The sacraments are these very ancient, mysterious stuff, you know, they're some ancient rituals. So a lot of people only associate it with Christianity or with like Jude, Judaism, mm -hmm. but there's also pagan roots for that. Uh, and that's something I mentioned in, the, in the entering the desert. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that, yeah, so that concept is very important. Uh, you know, some people see that and some people don't. Some people can be a Catholic and they have no idea. They, they, like those kids were Catholic. They didn't care. And God bless those kids. They, did, they were just, they didn't, they didn't know what was going on. They were just having fun. They have, they probably have a whole set of funny story about that, you know? Yeah. And so I think that's, that's very similar with whether it's, you know, we talk about any Abrahamic religion. Or, or whether it's a Hindu, a lot of people, it's just such a cultural thing, but they don't necessarily have a personal um, connection to that, and, you know, which is what we would say almost like Gnostic, where they, ha they haven't had a personal experience. Yeah. Well, so we're, we're closing in on two hours here and I don't want to keep you over though. I could probably keep asking you questions all day. And, um, we do have one, ch one question here in chat that I wanted to get to you oh, before the time yeah. runs out. Uh, but one thing I just wanted to say, to well, that's, are, are you really okay with going longer than two hours? Oh I yeah, mean, we can go, we can go, we can go longer if you want. For okay. Sure. Well, I mean, I won't keep you too much longer, but I do, I would Thank rather you. not rush us to the end cause I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, so the thing that I wanted to say was, I think, you know, I, as I said, I considered myself athe atheist for a very long time after I was not Catholic anymore. And the thing to me yeah. is like, it, I could make fun of Catholics all I wanted to. I could, I could say, oh, that's like zombie shit, like, uh, whatever, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, but 
but to actually like break into the Eucharist and like that just seems like you know you can be on the outside and laugh at them, but to like go into their sacred space and like de and like foul the space like that's wrong. Right. You know that's not a thing right. that, that regardless of what your feelings are, you shouldn't go into their space and mess it up like. Just right, have, have right. the decency to keep your, your jokes on the outs. Like, wait till you get out of school and make fun of the priest, but don't, like, don't, like, jump up in the middle of a sermon and call him an idiot or something, you know? Right. That just seems no, like, really, like, so, yeah, I could see where, yeah. like, regardless of where you you lean, like, that's a little bit too far. Um, so Tyler, uh, Tyler DP here says, uh, can you speak a bit on the Agori path and what it entails? Mm. There's a lot of misinformation. It seems on this when you can find any, yeah, I, 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 I'm interested in that too. So I really did want to, I don't know. I, I, you could probably talk a lot on, on Agora and that whole situation. Uh, but whatever, whatever you'd like to say towards that question. Yeah. That, thank you, Tyler, for asking that question. That's a great question too. And that, directly connects back to our concept of uh, define uh, the guru question or the Vamacharya or the left-hand path or Tantra about all these misconceptions of what those things mean. Mm -hmm. So for course, as an, as an initiated Agora, that's a very important path. It's my life path. That's, that's my entire de devotion to my spirituality. And so, of course, it has the, it's very glamorized. Um, actually, we could also bring in Haiti with this. You know, Haitian voodoo is very glamorized, just having something kind of like very dark or mystical. And they, they have these tropes that each of these systems must have, you know. Mm -hmm. So same thing with the Agoras. They think of, oh, that means someone's going to be in a graveyard eating flesh from a kapala, um, which is true. Yeah. But there's much more. They, but they don't see the Agoras that have opened up medical clinics to treat lepers. They don't see the agoras that have opened up medical centers to treat all the uh, what was what it would one time was uh, was called the untouchable class that people didn't want to help. Yeah. And so the agora path is a path of radical openness, radical egalitarianism, and helping everyone. And so it's it's and it, the the agora path is seeing the light of God or the light of divinity in literally everything on this earth. Yeah. Whether it's a whether it's a piece of shit or whether it's a dog or whether it's a human or whether it's um, a tree or, you know, that they see that everything is an expression of the divine and should be treated as such. And that's a very controversial point. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Some people don't like that. Some people don't like that idea that everyone's equal or that everything's equal or that. They're, but that's but from an agoric perspective, that's exactly what it is is that this, this incarnation is very rare. This human body is very rare and very temporary. So while we're here, we should, you know, devote ourselves to spiritual practice, but also to helping other people in any way that we can do that. And that, and that so, so there is different levels of that too. And some Agoras, based on their own karma, mm. would be doing different things. That, that's I what I was about I was to ask you. Yeah, and I remember once when I was in India, and I was with some agoras in a smashan in the where their corpses were and where corpses were burning, and there was one that was particularly interesting. I felt a connection to, and my and I said, you know, can I speak to him to one of my friends? And he said, Look, yes. He actually said you could speak to him. So I asked him, and I said, you know, if you don't mind, how did you end up here? And he, and he smiled. And when he smiled, his whole presence changed. And he said, and he, and he kind of touched my hand and said, thank you for asking. And mm. his dad had a translator. And he said, my parents died in a flood. And when I was one year old and I was just given to, I, I was just put here with this group. And that's how I, so that was, can you imagine that karma, right? Yeah. Can you imagine the karma of being that one year old, both your parents were swept away in a flood and some agoras took you. Yeah, yeah. Wow, <laughs> that, that is yeah, that is wow, really. Right? That's like that's like a that's like the, so, something to start a movie on. <laughs> yeah, and that's like that's like the Ramana Maharshi story, right? It's just yeah, like that was his. So for his particular path was a more radical path, but he's like, oh, I didn't really pick this. I just was here, you know. And then he conveyed that idea to me. He he conveyed to me 
he said, that's what you should, you have to do that. You have to understand this about life that like you are, as he told me, you we're, we're just play things with Christians. Mm, yeah. We're just, and, and he's Christians just playing with us. And so we should, and so that, now that was, you know, that's it. So that's one different thing. So there are different versions of Agora, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, but Agoras aren't scared of anything. And Agora is also used extreme state of consciousness to clear out any limitation in their consciousness. Well, too, so that could be extreme states of fear, extreme states of happiness, extreme states of pain. You go on, whatever it goes on with that. You know? Yeah, and, and we I drink from a and we and we we drink and we eat from a kapala to constantly remind ourselves of the temporary of the of the temporariness of life. Yeah, that, that, you know, that one day we will be a kapala. And that the concept of who, who Craig is will just be nothing. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, so are you? Um, are you familiar with the the documentary from the nineteen eighties that followed around the the one Aguri guy? Um, yes. yes. Okay. So so in in this book, uh, he uh, Aki actually meets that guy, and I don't oh, know right I don't on. know if you if you're aware, but he now has switched over to the. Um, the other path like what 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 are the there's the agoris and there's the what are the other what's the other version like uh the knots or something is M -M oh the knot yeah okay. so yeah, so he knot. started uh -huh. as an agori and then when aki met him he was like this this guy something or other and then not was the end of his title and he was like he's just like a regular guy like the rest of us sitting here around this table and then he explains to me like oh i used to be an agori and i did i was an agori for like 30 years and he's like what changed your mind and he's like well i just got tired of like i i felt like i had experienced all there was to experience in that direction and then i wanted to move into uh, this other direction and 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 get these other experiences now and it was so like just like interesting meetings like that are like the sort of thing where i'm yeah. saying you should check out that book because it's like he just meets like these people that like ended up being like really important people while he's just hanging out around the uh kumela so um that's fascinating and so uh a, 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 Hopefully that answered Tyler's question. That, yeah, uh, that. yeah, and and a little bit more on to, to that question. Um, I I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong or add to it or whatever, but I think um, when somebody is following that path, you it's almost like you're testing the limits of of the world of society of reality that's and exactly. and that's a exactly different it. a different person is going to see different limits that they personally want to test so the yes. ones that end up getting narrative the the narrative that that makes its way to the western world would likely be the most like shocking narrative so i would yes. assume that many agoris aren't just sitting on top of a corpse meditating those are the ones right. that we hear about exactly so that so while those are aspects of an agori path there's much more diverse aspects of it too but it is about pushing through any kind of limits because from a yogic perspective we have our our overall you know experience of reality is limited by what we would call some scotters and bosses they're almost like pre-programmed thought pattern or kind of habit pattern that we have. And most people are just, you know, going through their lives doing things because they think they know what they're doing, but they're just kind of living a robotic existence. Yeah. So from an agoric perspective. And that's where Tantra, you know, many of the ideas of Tantra come in too, is that the, and yoga as well too, is that we must decondition and clear out any of these limitations so that we can most assuredly experience the divine. Mm -hmm. And to do that, so everyone, like you said, everyone has their different level of what they need to push through to get that. And that's definitely not everyone's path, right? Yeah. It's definitely, that's absolutely not a path for everyone. Um, and matter of fact, most of the time, you know, I, I if anyone came to me and, and asking me for advice on, you know, Agoras, I would, I would usually recommend, because most people, it, 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 Hinduism and the esoteric ideas from India alone require such a radical reorientation. But to consider the concept of agora, this takes to a different level. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that should definitely not be your entry point. So, um, 
So this is a hard transition, but I, I don't want to keep you much longer, but I, I am very interested in your answer to this question, or at least just uh, your overview of this topic. So I yeah. I recently got my uh, Ferba, oh, Ferba, and I just got this a few days ago. And so I, it's it appears to be incredibly uh, important to all of your books, I think. Um, yeah. And it's it yeah. seems like you, you mention it as you get further through the three or at least through um entering the desert and tantric phys or uh, entering the desert and cult of golgotha i would say as you're moving yeah. deeper into those two books and understanding the ramifications of what you're actually talking about with uh, the cut up readings and everything um yeah. it yeah. seems like the ferba is incredibly which I, which I important you, i hope you enjoyed the cut up Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, that's what I'm saying. I could talk to you for hours because I haven't even got to that topic yet, and uh, and uh, there's things I'd want to ask, but I really don't want to keep you forever. So but we can we can touch on we can easily touch on cut ups if you'd like. Yeah. So so le well, let's say like if you can give a little bit of an overview of how furbas are important specifically to the traditions that you're laying out, and then transition from that into the cut up topic. Yeah, Fur furbas. I mean, you know, they have such powerful ritualistic use uh typically you know in tibetan tradition uh when i was when i was in <laughs> nepal and in tibet you, you know when i was in the deserts of tibet i had a, a certain experience which was what which was the inspiration for writing entering the desert mm -hmm. and that experience was connected to the, the gift of a fur Oh, okay. Um, but, and so that fur, and which I've never publicly talked about that. So the, the fur boat became very symbolic for me of the, the discovery of, of, of the idea of the book of entering the desert or the desert verse. So the desert verses were written as a result of that. So, but the fur boat, obviously, it has, you know, this symbolism of, of like obviously penetration, it can penetrate different realities. It can also demarcate different realities, and it can all it could definitely be like a protective type thing, but it can also be a separating thing, almost like a spiritual scalpel mm -hmm. um, in that aspect. And so, to me, it's it's a very important thing for us to know our boundaries, to set boundaries, and to also cut away anything that's not really important. Yeah. Um, and our, from my perspective, and and then from an agoric perspective too, our life should be a, a series of progressions of burning away things that we don't need. Yeah. You know, as you know, it should be as it, it's as I call it. Some, it should be some type of an alchemical combustion, where as we age and as we grow, that we're burning away, we're we're dropping off more and more things that we don't need. Hopefully, refining ourselves to understanding. What is it? What are the essential things we really need that, to be a good person, <clears throat> to be a human, to maximize our own uh, dharma, and to maximize our own? And so the ferva has that. And then obviously too, different fer you know fervas used in magical rituals have a magical potency. Mm -hmm. they, they they start to collect something which we would call ojas, magical ojas, which is a certain type of radiation which kind of fuses it and then once we hold that or possess that it can kind of radically quickly change our consciousness quickly change our state of mind just like a mala can you know the reason why most of the when people are using malas you know traditionally you'll see them in a bag a mala bag where, it, where it's hidden they don't want people to see it mm -hmm. the idea was that that, that mala was it, you know the more you use your mala you're infusing shakti into that mala and it starts to become a literal magical instance. Like when you see people wearing things, uh, most of the time, uh, it's not the stuff they're wearing is not what they're modeling. The stuff they're wearing is like blessed things, maybe Tulsi. Like I'm constantly wearing Tulsi. I'm constantly wearing Rudraksasis. Those are those are things that, that are acquired through certain rituals and blessings. But my malas are things that are they're just kept in the cell or mm. kept in and kept in a certain bag. The same thing with the furba, so you don't necessarily put those out in public. But the furba has very much powerful use for clearing out negativity. And then in the bond tradition, which is more kind of shamanistic Tibetan tradition, 
the the fur, but has a lot of interesting things for you know clearing out demonic activity, but also kind of, kind of like blessing demons and, and what, how the demonic influence of our addiction to the ego, our addiction to our emotions, um, and all this kind of stuff, like that, which are very yeah, yeah. It's it's a hard balance for me um, to uh, to say like where like because i with what i do i feel that aside from my own ego i need to be putting forward what i'm doing and showing yeah. things that i'm so like it's always a hard balance for me to say is this my ego that wants to like popularize this th like oh look at what i have oh look at what i'm doing yeah. where's yeah. the separation between that like look at me and I want to bring you guys into this world. I want to entice you not to think I'm cool, but to join into these things that I'm doing. And the yeah. only way yeah. to, 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 to draw people in is by showing them what I'm working. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a hard, yeah. 100. I, I feel well, where it's like, I should keep this to myself, but then I'm like, maybe I shouldn't because I am a particular person that is in front yeah. of these things. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, no, that's very, <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, that's, that you bring up an important point. I mean, we, all of us as humans are a work in progress. Mm -hmm. All of us are constantly struggling and battling with the dynamic of our ego and its relationship to our, our life. We're always trying to seek that alchemical, or at least we should be, hopefully striving to seek that alchemical balance. Yeah, and hopefully all of this will be gifted with a lifetime long enough of time on the earth that we can work on this because it's very precious time, and so that's kind of what we're all struggling to figure out. We're all struggling to do. Um, that's why I think you know we should avoid being overly critical, and we should focus more on helping people and working on themselves. Yeah, um, and, and that's that that is essential. But you 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 express very important points. You know, all this, you know, with our with our path, we sometimes want to show people things that we're doing in the sense that it can maybe inspire them or connect with others. That's a human thing. That's a human trait. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it all comes. It all comes from where our intentions are. And then, you know, what, how, how does it inspire us to continue to deepen our practice? Um, so there's a lot of nuances in that too. nuances within that as well yeah cool so um if yeah if you want to speak a little bit on the cut up situation um i, I mm. would i would invite you to do that again i know we're we're already 15 minutes beyond what i said was going to be the end i'm cool with continuing but i don't want to hold oh, yeah, you i know you're a busy person so i really don't want you to be like oh god so make it as quick no, if, if you want to if you want to move through it quickly move through it quickly if you want to take your time take your time it's up to you but this will be our last no, subject matter here today <laughs> today today's the moon's day so it's a good day to talk about these things and it starts off a week closer to halloween favorite week of yes year, so it's a good day to talk about these things. absolutely but no did you did, did you enjoy the cut up part did you did you find that interesting yeah and so like i mean yeah because it seems like the thing that i think is cool about the whole cut up topic that you that you discuss is like there's um there's more sacred texts texts that that you work with in this context but then there's yeah. also things that are more like you know william burroughs or i you didn't specifically uh mention him but um like clark ashton smith i noticed that you oh, uh, that you yeah. did a reading oh, i, I love clark ashton smith so i was like clark ashton, thinking yeah, that clark probably ashton also smith. falls somewhere into that even though you didn't use it as, as an example i'm sure that falls somewhere in there oh. as well yeah, Clark Ashton Smith would be uh, an example of someone like Ramana Maharshi who reached a certain state at a young age <clears throat> and, and, and we were blessed with being able to examine his work. I don't think people still to this day even grasp what he was doing. No, <laughs> absolutely. No, he, he really is sort of like a, a second, like people mention him in passing in relation to Lovecraft and like nobody really... Uh, I had no idea who he was until I started studying Lovecraft and, and, and realized like, um, 
you know what how 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 important Clark Ashton Smith was in his own right. Um I I haven't read much of his poetry actually, but I love his short stories. Have you have you read the letter the letters between Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith? I have maybe a couple of them I think, but not many. Oh, you should a hip, uh, hippocampus press put out a, a huge volume i'll send you a link after but you should check nice. it. it's absolutely so i have the selected letters the f- number five but i don't know if i'm i don't i think his might some of them are probably in there but if there's specific yeah. like a whole specific set of just lovecraft and and clark ash and smith i'd love to read yeah that. there's yeah there's a huge amount with that and it, it's just incredibly inspiring to read the, the correspondence nice yeah uh, yeah but no but cut up cut ups were very when i was young i re, uh, one of my do, undergraduate degrees uh before i went into medicine was in uh english literature and i and the american novel i specialized in the american novel after 1900 mm. and so i really 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 got into um william burroughs um and i loved the concept of cut up and then, of course, as I was as I deepened, you know, I was also working with esoteric practice and things. Of course, I saw the potential there, of, you know, finding hidden messages within the message. You know, if, if reading an occult text, there's also more occult text within it. Yeah. And so I, I thought that was an interesting thing to do and how we can find messages in there. And then in the cult of Gotha, that can be used as a very powerful way to communicate with other intelligence that they can. They can t- communicate via the use of the cut up. Yeah, uh, and cut ups c- cut ups can be very creative. You know, they can be cut ups like like literally cutting things up, or they can be as what Burroughs referred to in one of his letters uh, to Ginsburg. You can do cut ups with the eyes, where you can just scan over and do that as well. Mm. Uh, but I'm always fascinated with what comes out. You know, it's, there's always something very strange that comes out that moves us beyond our rational temporal mind into other mind space um, with that. So to me, it was always very interesting. And I, and I, I put that in Cult of Gospel because I want people to see that was a big part of, of that. It, we use that to cut up the text. So I'm really happy you enjoyed that. Yeah, that's really interesting to me. And like, I'm familiar with a lot, like most of the authors that you had mentioned in this context. And, uh, uh-huh. but I actually wasn't familiar with uh, the specific uh, use of cut ups through William Burroughs. And I sort of learned that through reading your book. And I still haven't got oh, as wonderful. far into the topic as I, I want to learn more specifically on this. You have inspired me to dig way deeper into William Burroughs than I currently uh, oh, that's have fun. gone. On. so there you go on yeah, that there's one. <laughs> some very, yeah there's some very interesting uh he has a lot of interesting material that i think is still um, kind of ignored sadly but it's all there you can, yeah. we can all find it for sure. yeah um i think um I re- I'm like 90% sure that it was him that wrote this. There's some book that, that somebody had wrote that I only got like one chapter into that I want to finish that was basically about like the United States became a wasteland after a oh, nuclear yeah, yeah. after a nuclear war yeah, and then somebody came uh-huh. back over yeah. and they're in search of like the re- remnants of humanity and then they find them out yeah. in Las Vegas and like a reincarnation yeah. of Charles Manson is their leader. I, I, I want to read that book. I, I got a little ways into it and then I started reading all the anathema books and I'm like, I'll get back to that. But that's like yeah. on top of the stack of things that I want to read. But I like had no, a PDF you'll, you'll and a I hate reading PDFs. So that's why I didn't even remember know, whose yeah. book it was. Like, I just can't do it. I have to have a book in my hand. So I, I need to buy I'm that the book. I'm the same way. Yeah. Dude, I have a, I have, since I'm in the medical field, I have to do, I have, you know, massive amount of reading I have to do. Yeah. And I, I, do read a lot of that on PDFs, which I absolutely hate. Yeah, it's so um, hard. But I love to. I, I can't. I love to have physical. I love to do that. So. Yeah, I had to have a mass exodus of my books when I moved. Um, okay, so so we're gonna finish up here. One last thing, uh, Tyler asked, yeah, and yeah. I should I should definitely ask this too before we go. Is Craig currently oh, working on any more books? <laughs> actually, I, actually, I am. Good to know. I'm working know. on. I'm working on two other books. Two more, and, great. Uh, two more books, and uh, one will be a continuation of concepts from entering the desert, 
and one will be a concept or, or a continuation of the concepts from Tom Pesic, but particularly Fantastic. focusing on uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Excellent. And, Excellent. And, and those and those will be out. Um, one will be out in 2023, and then the next one will be out in 2024. So absolutely beautiful. I'm really glad to Thank hear it. I will. I will it. absolutely yeah, so be looking forward to those. This is officially the first time I've spoken about that, so that this is the official announcement. Yeah, good. well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for making that announcement, and yeah, that is uh, that is great news and to those, hear. And those will be out uh, via Anathema Publishing. Perfect, perfect. Awesome. All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and call it a day here. Uh, thank you very much for taking almost two and a half hours with me, so I really appreciate the extra... I appreciate the initial amount of time and very much so you going longer because I had a feeling we would have so much to talk about. So I was right. No, it's my, <laughs> it's my honor. Thank you for having me on. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful Halloween season. This is a wonderful time for people to explore the darker side of life, the darker mysteries. And, and it's a very beautiful time that we moving into falls. So I wish everyone the best. Yeah, absolutely. As I always say, Help as many people as you can and help as many animals as you can. Exactly. I very much agree. All right. Well, thank you all for being here uh, watching with us. Thanks to everybody that's going to check this out in the future. And especially thanks to you, Craig. So uh, we will go ahead and call this a day. Peace. Peace out. All right, stream is over. Thank you so much, man. I really yeah, hope I really fun. hope you didn't mind going that extra time. I know it's like no, 